Okay, we'll be all right. Okay, I need to click that. Got it, but I can't. Okay, okay, okay. So I'm going to start by telling you a little bit about myself. My slides are mainly both in both languages, but not all the time. <laughs> so this. Okay, my slides are not moving forward now. Oh, okay, there we go. So I'm originally from the UK, as you can probably tell from my accent. Um, I've been in Japan for over 30 years. Um, I did French as my undergraduate degree. And when I came to Japan, I had zero Japanese. I self-taught, uh, I taught myself French, uh, Japanese, the three alphabets. I'm obviously still learning kanji. They're the, the real challenge. <laughs> Um, in and I've taught in France, of course, in the States and here in Japan and in the UK as well. Um, and when I came back to Japan uh, in in 2002, I founded my own school for children from zero to 12 years old. I trained my own teachers in the school. I created my own curriculum. And after that, I was sucked into uh, university teaching in 2015. And I started to teach the pre-service teachers. And now I no longer have my school and focusing on uh, the research and I'm doing research in phonics in elementary school classrooms. I've been doing it for a number of years, maybe about five, if I recall correctly. And so what I'm sharing with you is based on all that experience and all my research today. So I hope it's useful and I hope it's interesting. So basically today I'm answering four questions. Why do we teach phonics and what approach is best? And then I will look at materials with activities, of course, and how we set up our students for success. OK, so uh, I'm going to answer these four questions, but not in that order. So in my introduction, OK, we're going to look at what is phonics and why we teach it and go from there. All right. Are you ready? So what is phonics and why do we teach phonics? Does anybody like to write an answer in the chat or unmute answer either one of those questions? Anybody? Don't be shy. <laughs> you can say, I don't know. That's why I'm here today. <laughs> I mean, that's fine too. You know, that's wonderful. It's, uh, nothing in the chat so far. Okay, to prepare students how to read. Thank you, Maria. That's a wonderful answer. To learn how to read and pronounce words. Thank you, Alison. Amy, relationship between phonemes and graphemes. Oh, good words there. Thank you. Okay, so you know quite a bit already, some of you. Okay, the sound system. Hi, Mary. It's the sound system of language. Wonderful. Great. Some good answers. Thank you so much. Okay. Uh, maybe there's some of you who have absolutely no idea, and that's fine. Um, okay, to help decoding. Thank you, Cherry. It's lovely to see you here. Saw you at JELT um, a few weeks ago. Phonics is a system used to teach kids how to read in sound. Oh, lovely. Decode and encode. Okay, great. Okay, so, well, basically, from Oxford Languages, it's a method, here we go, of teaching people to read by correlating the sounds with a symbol in an alphabetic writing system. So that's the official definition, if you like. Okay, so we're correlating the sounds with the symbols. Okay, basically. Okay, that's what phonics is. But it's a little bit more complicated than that, okay? When we look at phonics um, and people say, oh, I teach phonics, but then I ask, well, okay, well, which approach do you use? Because, you know, how many are there? There are quite a lot and what are they? And so we need to start there in order to know how to go on. So I want to very quickly go over the four main approaches of teaching phonics, okay? There are four standard approaches that I group into two, the embedded, analogy and analytic. Don't worry if you don't remember these names, it's okay. And the slides will be available later, so you don't have to take notes, you can just sit back and listen, okay? Um, and those basically I put into one group, and then there's the synthetic phonics or explicit phonics, and I put that in another group. So I'm going to very quickly go through those in turn, okay? Embedded phonics. All right, so here, uh, this is the approach of teaching reading uh, in which phonics forms one part of a whole language program, okay? Embedded phonics differs from other methods in that the instruction is always in the context of the literature rather than in separate lessons. Okay, the skills uh, to be taught are identified 
opportunistically rather than systematically. OK, so they'll look at the text, they'll pick up something and they'll learn to recognize it. OK. Analogy. Now, this type of phonics, uh, children analyze the phon phonic elements according to the phonograms in a word. Phonogram, known in ling linguistics as a rhyme, R-I-M-E, is composed of the vowel and all the sounds that follow it. OK, such as A-K-E in cake. OK, so children use these phonograms to learn about word families. Sorry if this is a bit technical, <laughs> don't worry. <laughs> OK, so we've got cake, lake, fake, make, bake. They all end in A-K-E. That's a word family. OK, so um, the children start to analyze and pick up things like that. So again, the sounds are embedded in words. OK, ache, ache, ache. They pick that up. OK, analogy. Analytic. OK, now this one is popular in Scotland. OK, now the children are going to analyse uh, the, the sounds in the words. So this is the a method associated with teaching reading in which the phoneme, uh, the sound, is associated with particular graphemes, the letters, and they're not pronounced in isolation. So they identify or analyse a common phoneme in a set of words. OK, so here we have on the screen the R, er, phoneme, and that exists, that comes up in river, right, sorry, right, river, red, and ring, er. Now you can see immediately that this could cause problems with using this method with uh, beginners of, you know, Japanese beginners of English. It's going to be a big challenge. Okay. So synthetic phonics, okay, children learn the sounds of the letters to make the words. So you'll give them the letter, okay, you'll teach them uh, the sounds, the phonemes with the grapheme or the letter. They are pronounced in isolation and then they're blended together, okay. So for example, on the screen here, we've got s, i, p, and we'll learn that each of those letters has a sound and they blend together they make the sound sip or the word sip and of course they will not end up saying ship because they learn the s is a s okay so basically they're going from letters or sounds into words okay all right so uh with Okay, so this approach is, was the one that's both found to be incredibly effective with L1 English native young learners. So we have three that break down the language, embedded analytic and allergy, analogy, okay? And synthetic, which starts with the components and builds up. And that's the big difference between these approaches. And if you can grasp that, the breaking down or the building up. So the synthetic builds up, the others break down. Now, so the question we have now is if we are to teach phonics, which approach is the best for children with Japanese as their first language? And I think this is an important question because people go, I teach phonics. And then my question is, well, which approach do you use and why? <laughs> okay. So out of these four, I'm just going to give the answer, okay? And this is based on the research from Tamaoka. And if you want to look at it yourself, please go ahead. <laughs> um, basically, the answer is synthetic phonics. And that is the way, uh, that is why, because, the reason why is because of the way that hiragana is processed, okay, from Tamaoka's research. Okay, now, basically, um, just to give you a very quick overview, um, Tamoka says that, that hiragana is processed using what's called a sense determinative function, okay? And so when a child is learning a hiragana, they would read each uh, symbol, kore o yo ninde kudasai, okay, which is very similar to synthetic phonics, okay? So that would be the approach I recommend, and it's on that basis that I've created the four-step cycle. So why teach phonics? Well, basically, uh, as you have already said, okay, it can strengthen all four skills. They're listening, 
Students are reading, they're speaking, and they're writing through a balanced curriculum. Certainly in the four-step cycle they are. Okay, I've seen it builds confidence and motivation with students, which is a great plus when you're teaching kids. And it provides visible progress for the teacher and the learner and the student. Now, I want a quick question. How many of you actually have your own school or you teach out of your, you know, your own kyoshitsu? Can you, you can just put a yes in the chat because I can't see if you raise your hand. How many of you have your own school? Because uh, from my experience, okay, kind of yes, great. Okay, even if you're just teaching casually. Ruth, yes. One of the problems I, I or, or challenges, I shouldn't say problem, I found in having my own school was showing the efficacy of what I was teaching to the parents. They wanted to see evidence. But of course, if you teach a public elementary school, I will, what a lot of what I'm doing is focused on elementary school based on what I used to do in my school. So I, I'm hopefully covering both bases, but if you've got a question. You want, as a teacher in an elementary school, you want to see evidence of learning. You have to. But as, a, as in your own school or in your own classroom, you have to show that to the parents. Okay, private school. Your private school um, is going to want to see the evidence to show the parents because the parents are paying the fees. They're what's called the stakeholders. You want that. Phonics gives that to you. It helps you. Not only does it do that, and not only is there significant evidence from research with synthetic phonics helping in language learning. But what we have currently is a lot of, oh, okay, we hear this all the time, but with using phonics, okay, to help them progress in their language learning, it becomes, ah, and that's what we want. So you build a strong, solid foundation, all four skills. It helps in the long term build a more robust, uh, foundation for their future of oh, language learning. So that is why I really, really recommend teaching phonics. I've seen the results myself and that's what we want. Okay, so very briefly before we get into the meat of the four step cycle and materials and activities to go with it, any, any sort of, oh, help, I don't understand sort of, oh, uh, questions? Okay, not at this stage, maybe at the end, if you've got them, you can pop them in the chat. Okay, right. Okay, and remember, please, please, you can go back and look at the recording again um, and review as you would like to afterwards. Okay, so let's move on because <laughs> we want to cover quite a lot of stuff. So what materials and how do we set students up for success? Okay, all right, what we want is we want to establish an approach that will facilitate learning for our L1, our language one Japanese learners using synthetic phonics. So we're going to look at how to do that, okay, how to teach phonics in order to achieve tangible outcomes. Okay, we're not doing it just because it's fun, just because it's hip, it's now trendy. We're doing it because we want to see, you know, progress in learning, tangible outcomes. We want to set our students and our teachers up for success. I always believe in this and I've always taught my pre-service teachers Whatever you do, you're doing it for success in the classroom. It has to be attainable. Okay, so the four-step cycle. Let's have a look at this. Obviously, it is, it is made of four steps, and you repeat the four steps as you go around. Okay, so what are the four steps? You will start off with an input activity. Then you go to the processing activity, then a production activity, blending and fluency, and then you go around again. It's a simple cycle, okay? And so let's go through each step of this cycle, okay? So we start off with an input activity where the teacher introduces the sound or the phoneme. Now, this is what's called IPA. If you're not familiar with it, you can ask me and I can show you at the end. But this symbol is the sound R. Ah. Okay, which we write, okay, with the letter U, A, uh, as in up, okay? Now you're associating that sound, that phoneme, with that letter grapheme in step cycle one, in cycle step one, okay? 
All right, so the question is then, how do we do that? So if you're not familiar with these, don't worry, you don't actually need to be, but for me to illustrate today that sound, I use the symbol. Okay, and what order do we teach these in? Okay, so this is the order that I have uh, created based on the frequency of the letter usage in the English language. Okay, so I looked that up and created this one. So you go through each of these letters in turn in each of the cycles. So round one is a, a or a, round two is st, p, n, and then you go through all to round six. So that's why it goes in rounds, okay? And with the aim of empowering your student to not only read and decode English, but be able to say them. Because if you teach adults, you realize they can read, but they can't actually say the word, okay? But we want them to be able to say the word, and then they can hear the word, and then they can read and write what they hear. Okay, sorry, a lot of information all at the same time. Okay, input activity for our first five letters. And why do we start with the vowels? Because um, first of all, A is very frequent. These are frequent letters. And also because uh, Japanese, their first language starts with the vowel sounds too. So we're breaking down the barriers, making the first step very easy for them. Okay, so the input activity I use for round one, and the input activity is multimodal. It uses music, gestures, and visuals to enhance and deepen the groan, phoneme and grapheme connection. So I recommend doing that too, okay? So uh, you're co connecting these letters to symbols and sounds. So we've got ant, egg, ink, on and up. So here's the first one. So a ah, and. Now, how do we connect these together? Well, using music um, on way back in the day, now it's all on YouTube for free. <laughs> you can look up Jolly Phonics. I actually bought the stuff back in the day, the, the materials. The song that goes with it is um, a ah, ah, ants on my arm, a ah, ah, ants on my arm, a ah, ah, ants on my arm, they're causing me alarm. Now, uh, the part, the print that is in red is the only part that I hope or expect the students will stay, say, in the class. It's not very realistic for them to sing the whole song, especially not the first time without teaching the song. But your aim is not to teach the song. Your aim is for them to connect the sound of the letter with the written letter itself. OK, so keep in mind your focus and why you're doing this. OK. Right, so I'm going to play the song with you, to you, and um, you can read along as you go, okay? And hopefully uh, with your, wherever you are, you can uh, go ah, ah with the music, okay? Now the gesture that goes with this is if everybody can see me. I can't see myself, so I don't know if you can see me. Um, you run your fingers up your arm, ah, like a finger, like an ant is going up your arm. And I end with going, ah, at the end, ah, and the kids love that and they remember it. OK, so let's listen to the music and join me uh, with the song as if you're learning on, in the classroom, please, if you feel comfortable. <laughs> And so my arm, they're causing like, me. Ah. Exactly. Fantastic. Well done. Very good. Okay. I was tempted to ask you to unmute your mics and do that with me, but uh, uh, maybe you're not quite confident yet. But we will move on. Okay. Because I presume maybe you know these. Uh, um, so let's go to the next one. So the next one is e -e egg. The gesture is this. The song is this. E eggs in the pan. E -e -e Eggs in the pan, eh, 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 eggs in the pan, eh, 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 and crack the egg like this, eh. So please try and join. Look at the eh, eh, eh sound. Okay, are you ready? To the pan, to the pan, eggs in the pan, eh, 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 eggs in the pan, eh, 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 crack the egg like this, eh. Good, well done, that's fantastic. Thank you, okay, wonderful. Okay, so a, e, and the next one we're on to is e. Now, e is a little bit complicated in the story. E is actually a mouse. <laughs> and e goes e, 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 like a mouse would go e, e, e. 
okay? And uh, Inky, the mouse spilt the, uh, the ink and the mouse got covered in ink, so the mouse is called Inky. That's the story behind that with Jolly Phonics, okay? It's a bit of a complicated song for the story, for the students, but just it, 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 Inky is wet at the end. Okay, everybody? Inky the mouse is my pet. She spilled all the ink and got wet. She spilled the ink and got wet. She spilled the ink and got wet. She spilled the ink and got wet. That's nice at the end there. Thanks, Rob. So that is wet. <laughs> Great. <laughs> Good. Okay. So we've done a, a, e. Now we're on to a. Oh. And in the textbook, on is very easy for the students. And the light's going off. Yes, the music is fast. And therefore, as I said, I don't recommend trying to teach the songs to the students at all. Uh, but it is fun and you can repeat them. They're like 30 seconds to one minute long. So you can yeah, repeat easily. Okay, I'm just gonna rush through them today because I wanna teach you all four steps. <laughs> <laughs> and I want to do some activities with you. So, and I do assume that you kind of know the sounds with some of the letters. So, okay, here we go. We're going to do oh. Okay, so here it is. Now it's dark, the lights go on. Oh, 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 oh. Time for bed, the lights go off. Oh, 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 oh. And in the classroom, sometimes I turn the lights on and let them turn them, turn them off and they turn them on and we actually do it. So, ready, everybody? Oh, 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 oh. Now, if you've got American pronunciation or whatever pronunciation, don't worry. There are so many different pronunciations, but you're just trying to, and in my school, I had American teachers, I have myself, British. The kids can actually cope with a combination of pronunciations. As long as they're linking the sound to the letter, if the sound varies a little bit, it actually, I found it was no big deal. It didn't hinder them. They were fine, they coped with it. So we cope with it as native speakers. I can listen to an Australian or an American and I have no problem. So they actually don't get so hung up over it. The teachers seem to get more hung up over, oh, American pronunciation or oh, Australian pronunciation or whatever. But yeah, actually, you know what? It's okay, they can do it. Try, see, you'll, you'll, you'll see, you'll see. Okay, let's do oh, 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 oh. Ready? Now it's dark, the lights go on. Oh, 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 oh. Time for bed, the lights go on. Oh, 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 oh. Very good. Well done. Okay, splendid. So, a, e, e, o. And finally, a. Okay, a. Okay, the song is a, a, up go umbrellas. A, a, up go umbrellas. A, a. Up, go umbrellas. Right, the textbook has a picture of an ant wearing an apron to teach the sound of the letter A. Do I need to teach A for, no you don't is the answer to that because that's a, that's a dip song, that's true. The A sound actually is a combination of the letter A, the letter A and another vowel probably. So, mm, not at this stage. Okay, all right, so up, go umbrellas. So ready, everybody to go up. Up, up go umbrellas. Here we go. Up, up, up go umbrellas. Up, up, up go umbrellas. Up, up, up go umbrellas. When it starts to rain. Yeah, well done. Very good. Yay. <laughs> okay, so we've learnt the five, first five vowels. And normally I review those. And um, a, a. Or uh, you can do a very quick review using the bingo tune, a, e, e, o, a, and you can have them write it on the board and wipe it off, and so they're singing it without seeing them. There are all different kinds of activities you can do there too. Okay, input. All right, so next we want to move on to a processing um, activity to consolidate what we have learned. Okay. Now, this time I am not going to do a processing activity or a production activity or um, at this time because I want to move on so I can teach you how to do the blending later on. So no processing right now, but you would if you were teaching, okay? You would go on to this, but the activities are the same. 
Okay, that each round you can use the same activities for processing, the same activities for production, and the same activities for blending. Okay, all right. So let's move on to the next four letters, which are, here we go, S, S, T. That would help if I got them right. And N, S, T, N, okay. S, T, P, are unvoiced, okay. And N is very similar to the Japanese sound, so it's again quite familiar. Okay, so we're going to run through the input activity for these now. Okay, all right. <laughs> In the textbook, there's sick, there's pig, there's tennis and nest, there's decodable. Here's the song from Jolly Phonics. Okay, the gesture is the s of a snake moving through the grass. Okay, ready? Okay, okay, let's go. The snake is in the ground. The snake is in the ground. The snake is in the ground. So instantly they're saying s, they're not going sa or sa or anything else. It's s. Okay, the t, 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 tennis, your head goes back and forth. T, 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 t. Okay, here we go. <laughs> Good. Okay. I have a question in the chat. Which is better? <laughs> I don't think either is better. One is better than the other for teaching kids. Okay. The teacher should teach their pronunciation. They can be confident with how they pronounce the letters as long as they're not teaching ta you know, with the A at the end, they're teaching it. It's the vowel sounds that tend to change. So I wouldn't say one is better than the other. Okay, I hope that helps you. <laughs> okay, right, P. And the gesture is blowing out a candle. And actually it's really good because then they can actually hear uh, or feel how much uh, breath is on their finger. Okay. All right. Okay. How much time to spend on each sound? Hmm. Okay. Uh, can I come to that back to that in just a minute? Let's get through these letters and then I'll come back to that question. Okay. Thanks, Shredder. Okay. So puff out the candles on the pig pink cake. I don't even try and sing that. It's way too fast. Puff, 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 puff. And maybe puff, puff, puff at the end, but you don't have to do that. We want puff, puff, puff. Okay. Ready? <laughs> Okay, just remember the focus is getting the sound and the letter connected. Okay, here we go. And then on to mm, and it's a noisy aeroplane. Mm, but you might want to go mm, mm, whichever. Okay, here we go. Hear the aeroplane, hear the aeroplane, hear the aeroplane, making lots of noise. And the boys like to go around the classroom. <laughs> okay, so input, yay! We have managed to input nine letter sounds. Okay, so how do we process the activity? Now, uh, quickly, Rob, I'm going to answer your question, but hopefully more in full later. How much time? Four to six year olds. Well, I taught phonics in my school to four to six year olds. It does take a while. It's a lot of repetition. But I used to do about 15 minutes at the beginning of every class, including circle time. And I would basically, without realizing it, I'd go through each one of these steps. OK, in the four step cycle. So. 15, 10, maybe 10 minutes on the input and then 10 minutes on processing the following week and 10 minutes on the output and then 10 minutes on the blending. OK, and you just go at the pace of the students. So if they need more time to consolidate or you're not convinced about the output, you stay there until you're ready and then move on to the blending. OK. I hope that answers your question, but roughly 10 minutes every week. It's it's the drip feed method, as my mother, my mother's also a teacher. She said, drip feed method. <laughs> okay. Keep at it continually all the time. Okay. So 
A processing activity. Okay, so here the learners are given the opportunity to process or internalize what you've taught them in step one. Okay, now uh, I normally do this. Uh, this is the activity here is uh, karuta, but not just slam. Okay, it is slam with music. So it's musical slam, I call it. And the reason why I do this is you play the music all the way through. And you don't let anybody choose the card until the very end because you need everybody to process and be confident they know which one it is. You can take out the music later once you're sure that that, that link has been made, but the first step with the music. So we're gonna do it right now, Zoom version. <laughs> okay, yeah, I know. Um, but obviously you can't slap the cards. I would like you, while the music is playing, to write the letter in the chat once the music ends. I'm going to show you the letter. Okay, so here are our letters that we've just learned. Okay, so now we are going to do our activity. Here we go, musical slam Zoom version. <laughs> okay, so please listen and write the letter in the chat before the music ends. The snake is in the grass, the snake is in the grass. Great job. The snake is in the grass. That's it. Good. Oh, did everybody get it in there? <laughs> oh, <laughs> hi, Michael. Okay, good job. Well done. And let's check our answer. Which letter is it? It is the letter S. Well done, everybody. Good job. So the letter S now goes off the screen. <gasps> it's gone. Okay. All right. Ta-da. And which one is it this time? Are you ready? Three, two, one, go. So my own, so my own. Good job. Ah, it's Melanie. Clinton. Great job. Oh, well done. Oh, you nearly all got there. Yay. And the answer is, of course, ah, the letter A. Ah, bye bye. And it goes off the table. If you're doing this in the class, take it off the table. Okay. So less and less letters. Ready? Here we go. Here's the next one. When I watch the tennis game, when I watch the tennis game, my head goes back and forth. Fantastic. Oh, not as quick as last time, <laughs> but yes, we got there. And it's the letter T. -t. Okay, well done. Bye-bye. Okay, and the next one. Are you ready? Oh, what's happened? Oh, here we go. Good job. Well done, everybody. Absolutely. That's the letter P. Let's. Oh. Oh, 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 okay. Come on. There we go. Okay, good. Right. And that's gone. Okay. And we keep going. And the next one. Ready? Pinky the mouse is my friend. She's built the ink and comfort. The ink is wet. Good. E. Well done. And E is I. Now, sometimes, you know, they get confused with E and I, so it's, it's really good to do that. Okay. Next one. Are you ready? Hear the aeroplane. <laughs> Hear the airplane. Hear the airplane. Making lots of noise. Great, fantastic. And of course, that's the letter N. Mm. And we see a little net in the corner there. It's gone. <gasps> We've only got some vowels left. Da 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 da. Three more times. Ready? Eggs in the pan. Eggs in the pan. Eggs in the pan. Crack the egg like this. Egg. Okay, and if you see a student struggling, put the gestures in for them. It helps them recall. Okay, well done, everybody. Yes, it's the eh, egg. Okay, just a note here. I'm noticing that some people are putting capitals or moji in the chat. Uh, from teaching phonics, I never use capital letters. Okay, if you've got a question about that, talk to me afterwards. Okay, let's keep going. Okay, you've got two 
Is it last three? Yes, last three letters here, but uh, <laughs> let's see. Okay. Now it's time for lights go on. Oh, 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 oh. Time for bed, the lights go on. Oh, 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 oh. Yay! Well done. And of course, that is the O. Oh, 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 oh. Okay. All right. Now, I have left two cards on the table, but this is the last time. And I've left these two because they get confused very easily. But with a gesture, it's a real help. Okay. That's right. Ah, and ah and ah are so similar. They can get so confused. That's why context, the music, the gestures all help to reinforce the learning. So well done, everybody. Good job. Fantastic. Okay. So now that's the set. That's the we've done the processing activity, the musical slam. We're going to move on to a production activity. Okay. Oh, this time, time we want the students, the teachers, the kids to recall. Okay, by themselves, what you've taught them. Okay, now a very, very um, effective um, activity for this is tic-tac-toe. Okay, there are other ones as well. Okay, there's uh, what I call the eraser race. Erase. We'll come to that in a minute. So tic-tac-toe, are you familiar? Who knows tic-tac-toe? I do. Yes, yes, yes. I've got one hand, do you know? I do, okay. Shredder knows, Bob knows. I think Cherry knows. Okay, Pauline. I don't know. Who does not know? I don't know. Oh, the only winning move is not to play. <laughs> I do. Most of you know this. Oh, I don't know. Okay, we've got a couple of other I don't knows. Okay, okay. All right. Mm. <laughs> oh, <goodness. laughs> well, I used to zoop this. I used to scaffold this up for six sixth graders but um let's i'll teach you the basic version and then uh, i'll take some volunteers and we'll try and do it on zoom okay so here we go um if we're playing in pairs they just take turns if you can play in groups of three or four um that's that's good too now the first person's going to choose a card they'll point to it they'll say the letter the sound of the letter on the card OK, sometimes they say the word as well, and, and that's fine, too. You want the sound to match the letter and then you turn the card over like that. OK, so you say S, the S goes, turns over. OK, all right. If it doesn't match, I was quite, quite strict and quite brutal. They, they Sorry, I would teach them, but then they don't get the point. The card doesn't get turned over. We moved on to the next student. It, it seems a little bit cruel, especially if they're really small kids. But you know what? Once you've done that one time, they're really focused the next time. They'll learn super quick. And it doesn't mean they've, you know, they've lost the game. OK, so we'll do that. The next one, the next person would choose the sound. So this, this time it's going to be the R. Uh. OK, and maybe get them to do the gesture, maybe even say the word, turn the card over. OK, then they're randomly choosing. But what they want to do, the aim is like bingo. They want to get three in a row. OK, like this or like this. OK, and as I said, I, I created a <coughs> point system. Some more question. <laughs> OK, OK, um, and then. Uh, but that, that's not the game. The game is over when all the cards are turned over. OK, now um, this was popular with even, you know, Nencho, the five, six year olds, and then all the way up through to Rokunense enjoyed this game when I taught them. But as I said, I had quite a complex point system with the five, fifth and sixth graders to make it um, exciting for them. Right, so I would like, we're going to do this. Um, I would love to do this in, in breakout rooms, but it becomes very difficult. Um, it's anyone wins? Well, you see, um, yes, that's right. And if you use points, it can get even more fun. And, and you're going for the points rather than the three in a row, which then takes the emphasis off the language learning and more on the game, which then really helped them I found okay so I'm going to get out of zoom 
This is always a bit risky, isn't it? Let's see if this works. Okay. And we're going to go to another, a new share. Okay, good. Okay, so now you see this screen. Okay, it looks, looks similar, but it's slightly different. Okay. Okay, I would like three volunteers. Uh, we'll play this. Who would like to volunteer? They're, you're going to have to unmute. Anybody who can unmute and wants to play. <laughs> okay, Alison, thank you. Rob, I see you too, too. Thank you. And uh, I will, says, uh, okay. I don't know how I say your name. F -O -F -F -O -M -A. Paulina, Paulina, okay. Great. So we've got Alison, Rob, and Paulina. Paulina, can you uh, can you share your screen or or not? If you can't, hmm? let me try. Oh, not share your screen. Sorry. Can you can you and can I see? Can we see your face to play? Okay. Let me try. If you can't, then then you know don't worry. It's just it's nice to see who you're playing with. Oh yeah, you got camera. I can't. You can't. Okay. Well, we can't see you, but we can hear you very clearly. So that's lovely. Uh, see, we can see you. That's all we need to do. <laughs> oh, okay. Uh, oh, okay. Maybe it's uh, maybe it's a, a lack on my end here because I can't see everybody. Okay. All right. Well, I can. Okay. Oh, right. I can see you now. Thank you. Wonderful. Oh, you lovely. I love your image. Anyway. Okay. Let's focus. All right, so I'm just going to keep this simple. I was going to say we'll go in alphabetical order. So that would be A is Alison and then P. Okay, Paulina and R. Rob, you're last. I'm sorry. Last but not least. Okay, so we'll play this once and then maybe I can try and show you how I would do the point system. We'll give it a shot. Okay, so Alison, choose a letter. Please say the sound. Okay, I'd like to go for X. Egg. Egg, egg, yeah? Yes, egg, egg, please. All right, and then Alison would get one point. Okay, all right, wonderful. Fantastic, okay. Paulina, what letter would you like to go for? I'd like to go for... Mmm. Mmm, net. Noisy airplane, well done. Okay, so those are gone now. Right, so Rob. I think it's a little bit easy for you to get three in a row, but uh, <laughs> go for it. Should I? Should I? Okay. Yeah. All right. Uh, I'd, I'd like. Oh. I'd, I'd like the T, please. I'll go with T. -t, -t, -t. T, -t, 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 -t Very good. And hang on a minute. There we go. Okay. A little bit of a. Okay. So now we've got three in a row. Okay. I'm going to keep it simple the first time round, but I wish this was a second time round because then I could teach you the point system. But let's just keep it simple. Okay, well done. I give you a big clap. Yay! Good job. Three in a row. Yay! 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 Okay, and back round to Alison. Your turn. Okay, um, I'll go with op, please. Op, 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 op. And that one's gone. Okay. Okay, Paulina. I like to go for. Wonderful. Snake in the grass. Sit down. Go on. I think I'll have to go with A for A. Ah, ant. Okay. okay. Oh, that's my letter. I wanted the A. I'm sorry. Next time. <laughs> okay, I'll go for E, please. Okay. E, E, Inky, Ink. Great. Okay, Paulina. I'll go for. Fantastic, beautiful. Goodbye, P. And. Ah, uh, hard choice. Um, let's. <laughs> mm, yeah, I think I'll go with you for uh. Ah, oh, fantastic. Uh, uh, okay. Uh. <laughs> that would be a, a simple. Yes, class, we did it. Ichin, like in Ichin Ensei, first grade kids, we did it. We finished it. Well done, class. Good job. Good job. Thank okay, you. but so I think we maybe. Oh, we don't have time to do the point system. It may be in the Q and A. Okay, we better move on because it's ten fifty two. Gabby, when do I have? Oh, uh, Ruthie, when do I have to stop? What time? How much more time do I have? Mm, yeah, I oh, think a little bit past. I think a little bit past eleven is fine. 
Gabby. All right, about 10 more minutes. So we're going to move on. 10 more minutes, yeah. Hopefully another time I can go through my my, my fantastic point system, <laughs> she says. <laughs> okay, go ahead. Okay. It seems like the first piece in person will always be a disadvantage. Is there a way? Yes, and I do that with the point system. Exactly. Uh -huh. <laughs> yes. Uh, yeah. Okay. So um, we're going back to the slides. Okay. There we go. Great. Okay. And I'm going to. So I'm gonna, my screen has. Okay. The meeting has. The, the, it's, is it sharing? I can't get my cursor. Sorry. I. No, I'm not. Okay. Here we go. No. Still not sharing. Okay, hang on one moment. Don't read that. Okay, keep going. Come on. We'll get here in a minute. Is that share? That's still not sharing. I don't know why it's not. Okay, hang on a moment. Okay, I'm going to stop sharing. There we go. And then it'll let me share again. Okay. I think, no, that's not it. <laughs> Sorry. I've lost my slides. Okay. Okay, I've got my slides back and now I haven't got Zoom. Oh, wonderful. <laughs> we can hear you though. You can hear me. Wonderful. Mm -hmm. But yeah. it helps if you've got the visuals. Now we see you. You see me, but you don't see. Okay, hang on a minute. Let's try this. Right. I think this might work. Yes, finally. Okay. Yes. Okay. <laughs> Sorry about that, everybody. All right, so that is tic-tac-toe, okay. And that gives the students time to think about the sounds and give the production of the, the, the letter sound with each letter there, okay? All right, so, oh, okay, I think I see what's happened here. I'm just trying to, Zoom has taken over my screen. Okay, sorry, I just want to be able to see what I'm doing here. Okay, that's good. Okay, so let's moving on to blending and fluency. Okay, I think we're, nope, we're not in my, okay. I've lost my cursor again. It, ah, okay, that's back, obviously. <laughs> oh, okay, fine, it's moving all by itself. Right, so what we're trying to do is we are um, teaching the combinations, okay, in blending, no, hang on. Let me just, I'd like to step, oh, okay. Okay, just go back. Right, blending and fluency. So we've gone through the production activity. Now we move into blending and fluency. Now, this is something I don't see taught in any elementary school textbook, okay? And what you uh, want to be careful of here is presenting your grapheme, your, in this case, I'm choosing S, okay? And combining it with other letters, but keeping the S sound. So SN or S are okay, but sh, s, h is not okay. Okay, so that's the next slide. Okay, so teaching s, s, n, or sp are okay, but it's, when you put it with the h, it's changing the sound to sh. Okay, so you want to be careful how you're blending your letters together when you're teaching the students. And I've got a lot of materials on that if you want some support there. And what will end up, they'll be end up being able to read snip or spin rather than ship or shin. Okay, they'll get the pronunciation correct. Okay. Okay, so input activity, consolidation activity, production activity, blending and fluency. So moving on to blend and, and you go round again okay so blending and fluency at the end of round two you've got all of these letters okay now i would have the students i have them i give them a, st a stack of cards um each or you can do this in groups if you've got big lessons okay big classes um you've got 20 kids groups of four five groups each five sets of cards okay and then i have them arrange them on their desks like this and then i will go oh 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 and they can pull out the o oh, o oh, o oh, and put it on their desk, okay? And I teach from the vowel to the consonant first, VC combinations, because you're not creating the katakana type combinations from the beginning. You're getting them to get each sound in isolation. So 
or okay and i'll bring out the, the next letter which is the t here or now i'd like a volunteer to do this with me please who feels confident they want to try anybody want to unmute I i'll try okay great okay fantastic so what's this oh oh uh, oh uh. Oh, fantastic. Very good. Oh, and this is? Uh, Very good. One more time. Oh. T oh. T oh. T Very good. Well done. Yay. <laughs> and so we have the students do that in class. They bring them down and they read them together. Okay. My lovely volunteer, are you ready? Can we carry yes. on? Yes. Okay, so what's this? Very good. And what's this? I. T. I. It. Very good. Well done. Fantastic. And everybody in the class is with me. And we've made it and we've said it. We've blended together two letters. Yes, it's very exciting. We're beginning to make mm -hmm. words. Okay, fantastic. Stay with me, okay? Because what we're doing is we're just making vowel constant, vowel constant. We're just changing one letter at a time, keeping confidence up, keeping um, the, the work in the brain to minimum. Okay, ready for the next one? What have we got? Okay, yeah, great, thank you. Ah. T. Ah. T. Ah. T. Ah. T. Ah. T. Fantastic. You just do that with them and then they can do that. Air. Mm. Air. Mm. Air. Mm. And. Very good. You are a fantastic student. We're going to take it up a level now. Okay. We've gone through a number of combinations with the vowel and the consonant. And that's the wonderful thing about these letters that we've got here on the table. Okay, so now. Yeah. Yeah. So you're getting quite good at this now, so we're going to add in another one. App. App. Tap. Fantastic. And now you've read a three letter word. It's very exciting. Mm. Students love this. And. Mm. Good. App. Mm. App. Mm. App. Nap. Fantastic, isn't that fantastic? Ready? <gasps> da, 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 da. And. Pan. Good, and we can get a little bit faster as the student gets more confident. Okay, and now we're going to build up even more letters into our word. And this is all repetition of all the letters we've learnt. What's this one? What's this one? Can you hear me? One more time, please. Maybe it's not uh, going through, but uh, I'm just trying to say... Oh, I got it that time. Yeah, okay. <laughs> Fantastic. Right. Okay. So let, we'll speed this up because we don't have a lot of time left, but. Uh, well, if that's, then I would say pans. Good. Pans. Okay. We're using the S. Yeah. It pans. You could use yeah, okay. it, but that's, that's, okay. another, that's another session. Okay. <laughs> okay. And then what we do, because we're only wanting them to, te to, to get the letters and the combinations right now. Okay. And if we do that. Pants. Very good. Well done. Okay. And basically, thank you so much. <laughs> thank you. Volunteer. Thank you. <laughs> and you would build up by letter going up. Now that's a nonsense word. I'm going to come to nonsense words in a minute. You build up and you build up. And then you go into round three blending. We're round three letters are the C, the R, the L, and you've got sprint and splint. And you can see instantly there. They've already know the other ones. There's only one new sound going in the word they're familiar with. And you build up. Every blending is building on the previous cycle. 
Okay, so eventually you're going to get, they know all sounds of all the alphabet. They've been blending all the way through. So I just want to talk to you about nonsense words and what, what, what function or what purpose it does to do nonsense, nonsense words. Number one, that students, a lot of the students don't have a wide vocabulary. So many of the words that you will do with them may be a nonsense word to them because they don't know it. OK, so to them, is this a word or not a word? They don't know. OK, but nonsense words also help build longer words. So we know what this is, don't we? Um, any volunteer to unmute to say this word for me? Now you can read it. <laughs> Drum. Drum. Fantastic. Thank you. And then stay with me, please. Mm -hmm. We've got a new word here. And what's this word? Pan. Fantastic. And then what's this? Jan. Fantastic. So now you can read this new word. Panjandrum. Very good. Panjandrum. And that is a real word. You can look it up in the dictionary later. Okay. <laughs> totally phonetically decodable. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Okay. Panjandrum. <laughs> panjandrum. Absolutely. Yes. Panjandrum. It, and I said it's a word. You, yeah. So blending and fluency. I need to put my skates on and wrap up okay so uh blending and fluency we can also use when you've got the words and they're reading them i've created word cards that they're there they're on the slide and uh the eraser race a car race uh, david paul if you're familiar with his wonderful wonderful work um you have this the students go around in a circle mm -hmm. and they junk in they rock scissors paper and then they say the word on the card. So you've gone from letters into words because they're already blending, adding in new letters as you go with the blending. OK, uh, the cards on the left are the wonderful Oxford floppy phonics series. No, I don't get anything for saying this. <laughs> Oxford jolly phonics get nothing. No, or David Paul, though. But I'm just telling you what works, what I've used, what works and what I can recommend. OK, so as I mentioned, as I start wrapping up now, the four step cycle is four steps. It's measurable. It's attainable. You go around, you are repeating each time. You don't need different activities. You can focus on the learning rather than uh, teaching a new activity. And the order of the letters is based on the frequency in that is used in the um, in the English language. Now, very quickly, in my last three minutes, where care is needed and, and important points to consider, okay, your activities, please make them systematic, measurable, and enjoyable. You want tangible outcomes every time. You want to see progress in learning. There are a lot of materials out there. They're not all necessarily good. Okay, so you have to be wise in your in your usage. Remember, there are good things about some of them. Puff, puff, puff is fantastic with the gesture, multimodal approach. Okay, and you want to try and link each sound the d, to a word and to a symbol. You get that all going round and round, okay, together. I click put them onto anchor words. The anchor words I've taken from the elementary school textbooks here in Japan. Those anchor words are this. And you see a picture on the corner of every letter that relates to the anchor word. So you can always come back to that word for recall for the student. And these word cards are up on the Google folder through the open line chat. OK. All right, be careful. You want to focus on the on the outcome of the activity. Don't get caught up in getting having them sing the song when it's going to be too much of a hurdle for them. If they can do it, that's great. But uh, you know, just 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 have realistic expectations for them. Also, for things with Jolly Phonics, it's not designed for Japanese learners. It's designed for native learners. So you've got things like gurgles down the drain. Okay, which okay, that's definitely not a high frequency word. Let's face it. Okay. It's not in a textbook either in elementary school. So just skip over that. Don't get them caught up in that. OK, the, the, I mean, the slam can be a production activity without the music as well. OK, um, just take out the music when it becomes um, production. But for consolidation, I recommend the music. OK, one of the things with production I've seen in my teaching, which is the lovely teacher steps in to help them recall by giving them the answer. That is not helping your student. Give them time to think. 
let them recall if you t if you give them the answer it's going to hinder them in the long run they're going to lose confidence they won't be able to do it it's it's just it's it's not a good idea okay so production activities tic-tac-toe you can do it with words turn them over and i said you can have a point system again you can do production through the um the car race or eraser race note you've got words at this stage because they're already blending blending you want to give them as much time as they need to blend 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 okay you can blend by having writing on the board like i've done many different ways i'm sure that you can come up with other activities that work in your classroom okay so those are the ones i've used i also use worksheets for tangible outcomes there are some in the google drive okay circle word fill in the vowels dictations think and write which one and anagrams okay right so um i like a worksheet because it's something the kids can take home and show their parents tangible outcomes all right so we've gone through the four step cycle and uh, materials and activities for teaching and we've looked at some of the areas that you just need to be uh, aware of and be careful advantages and disadvantages of using jolly phonics you repeat it six times so it's easy to do it's easy to follow okay lots of repetition on it doesn't become boring because they know the activity but the content of the activity differs every time I want to thank you this morning for coming, for your time. We whizzed through there at the end. Uh, those are my references. And if you have any questions, you can email me on hokkaidofox at gmail.com anytime. I want to thank you for your time and your participation this morning. You have been absolutely fantastic attendees. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Kate, we have some leftover questions in that came in early in the chat box. Thank you. Yes. Um, one is what age is phonics most effective? Mm -hmm. I guess in in your opinion, according to your research. Okay. Um, okay. I, I'd like to re-angle that question. You can teach phonics to children from the age three all the way up to, I've done sixth grade, they're doing it in, in, in junior high schools now in, in certain prefectures. Um, it's going to depend a, a lot on the linguistic background of the child, are they just, and you know, what's happening at home and their personality um, and how much exposure they have to the actual sounds of the language. Like, so, I mean, it's, it's, I would say doing this with Lokunense, sixth grade kids, is late. I, I would love to see it in the elementary schools. Even grade one, grade first graders can do this. Um, it's, it's not beyond them. At the, at the latest, I would say third graders. But the best age is going to depend on the, um, you know, the, the, the child and their background and everything else. So, yeah, I hope that helps. Can I add to that? Yes. Um, for me, third grade is key because it's when uh, most kids start learning nomaji in school. So um, in Eikaiwa, I try to push phonics, it, hopefully in an enjoyable way, as much as I can until third grade. Um, yeah, and would, then hopefully. Yeah, to come, come, come on that too with, with, um, with, with romaji. My kids in my school would come in having, you know, learned phonics from, you know, nin when they're in kindergarten they go to elementary school and at that stage it was fourth fourth grade um, they would learn romaji and they'd come in and they would be confused yeah um, i just said to them listen romaji is not english romaji is japanese using the roman alphabet and as soon as they could compartmentalize that in their mind then all problems were solved yeah so that's something that might be useful for some people here today yeah we had one last question. Uh, how many lessons or times do you devote to phonics per year? Okay. Do you start writing with seven-year-olds? Yeah, absolutely. I was in, in my I had an immersion kindergarten in my school, and they were they would start, you know, fine motor skills from three, and they would they would be writing um by four, they would be writing just simple letters and so they can do that, yes. Um so how many lessons and times a week? Okay, so I would do, um, if you're in, okay, so if you are a 
in, in your own school or you're in elementary school. Elementary school, you've got 30, 35 classes a week, uh, a year, sorry, a week, <laughs> um, maybe, D depends. But I would just do basically, I would do 10 minutes every class. That's what I do. It's like a warm up. Okay, get them used to the sounds, get them used to the letters and then move into the, the, the main bulk of your textbook learning. So um, I had, a, when I did my school, I did 40, I had 40 weeks in a year, every every time, circle time and phonics, it was the whole thing wrapped up all into one, take, took 15 minutes. Now, what I'm doing in elementary school, I don't have that, um, that privilege to be in every week. So I do one big class, a 50 minute class once a month and we get through the six rounds. So it's the whole thing. I go from input to blending in 50 minutes. Boom. Wow. Well, yeah, but that's, I have little choice. So it's I, not ideal, but it's not. Yeah. Ideal. yeah. Cause it's once a month they forget, but they, they, but they, they, they learn to read. They can do it. I had one kid learn at the end of the year, he read economics, put the card down, he read it. So if they can do it, it's um, phonetic. Yeah. Yeah, it is. And it was home economics was the topic in the in the in the textbook. So it was something familiar to them. Yeah. Are there any other questions that we missed in the chat box? I have a question. Yeah. Um, I teach university students who are not above uh, all kinds of silliness uh, that you uh, that are meant for children, children's activities. But um do you have any suggestions for how to uh, how to deal with university students who never got this or adults? That's a tricky one. Yeah. Um, OK. Adults, if they're in your own school, is easier because you can use words like pandandrum. They've never heard of them before, but you can challenge them with more adult words um, that they can enjoy and then they can get, you know, appreciate, you know, what they're learning and going through it. Uh, the phonics, you know, program uh, for university students. I find there's more resistance, um, and I did it with my teacher training. They love it. They they get it. But then they're going to be teachers, and they're, they're those kinds of people. Whereas if you're teaching uh, a lot more like the engineers, <laughs> if those are your your students, you're going to come up with more resistance. They don't definitely music is not something they want to do. They don't want to do the gestures. Um, it's a it's a lot harder hurdle and to be honest with you i i haven't um what i do with them is i teach them intonation and the importance of intonation and they, then they then they realize once they realize that then we they're more open to work on pronunciation yeah mm. but that's a different session <laughs> we have a few more questions, um, but I think we need to take a break, um, give people a chance to get some water, get up and stretch, and we will have time at the end. So if you have a question that didn't get answered, uh, we should have time at the end um, to continue. Yeah, and Mary's written in there, she teaches special one workshops for all of her first and second year classes at university. Hats off to you, Mary. <laughs> okay. All right. See you later. And I'll answer the rest of the questions. Thank you again. Thank, Thank you so you. much. Thank you, everybody, for your participation. Thank you. Thank you for the comments. Thank you. Thank you very much. And we'll have a little bit of a break for as people have a drink or <laughs> just to move away from the computer for a little while. And we'll start with Alison's presentation at 11.30. Uh, another big thank you to Kate. Thank you, Kate. <clears throat> thank you.
Hi, Kathy. Nice to see everybody here. I just came back yesterday, so I wasn't sure if I was going to be able to stay awake, but I'm back. We're so happy to have you here. I was surprised. I'm so happy to be here. I can help you with a presentation if it's this time of day. This is a good time of day for me. What time of day is it there? It, it's 8.30 p.m. Ah, good, good. So I actually just finished teaching my Japanese students who I teach online. Mm -hmm. um, I teach them from 9 a.m. to 10 a.m. So, and then we had dinner. <laughs> so <laughs> it's, it's your 9 a.m. to 10, 10 a.m. It's my seven, 6 p.m. to 7 p.m. Okay, great. That's great. good to know then. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. So I, I'm happy to help you. Great. Well, uh, I think we're ready to start with the second presentation. Allison, are you ready? Yes, I am. Great. Okay, we're ready here. Okay. Well, uh, hello, everyone. And uh, thank you for inviting me to speak today. Um, my title is uh, Changing the World One Book at a Time. Perhaps this seems a bit of a sweeping statement, uh, but hopefully by the end of my presentation, you'll be able to see how it could be a possibility. OK, so. Um, just moving along to um, explain the outline of my presentation today. First of all, we're going to be looking at what is a picture book, just to confirm that everybody's imagining the same thing. And uh, as answering the question, why use an interactive approach with picture books? This is because a lot of Japanese learners in particular are used to being read to and being very passive during this kind of uh, activity. And we want to move them away from that passive uh, mode into more of an active mode for learning, not only English, but uh, using lots of other skills as well. And we're going to try an interactive read aloud together today. Uh, after that, we'll focus on what skills we can uh, develop. And I'll show you some examples from my classroom. And finally, we'll look at some responses from children for the same picture book that we read together. Okay. And the subtitle for this um, presentation is Alison's uh, Adventures in Picture Book Land. So that's why mm -hmm. we've got the Alice in Wonderland illustration there. Okay. Good. So um, just to give you some background on my uh, relationship with the topic in hand today, from 2000 to 2012, I was a picture book user myself in a Japanese elementary school, uh, using books with first to sixth graders in regular public um, elementary schools. After that, I moved to Miyagi University of Edu Education, where I was a teacher trainer, so I started to uh, read more about different approaches uh, so that I could pass on this information to my learners who were uh, training to be teachers. I also started experimenting uh, in classrooms, although I wasn't a teacher of young learners anymore. I created um, uh, situations where I could uh, still uh, carry on using them with children. One of these was uh, from uh, 2015 to 17. I fixed um, up 20 sessions to use just picture books with young learners. Uh, also, um, I started another session uh, It froze. Did Alison freeze? Mm, Alison's frozen just for a sec. Oh. We'll just wait a little bit until Alison comes back online. This sometimes happens. Kathy <laughs> yeah. just said, I'm here to help, so. <laughs> <laughs> 
I did. Oh, am I muted? No, nope, you're I on. Did, oh, there. I did use the story mixed in my adult presentation. Jeez. But I miss you, Ruthie, and I miss Icha, and yeah. I did see Allison though. She but that's a really, Joshua. that's a really um interesting story. Yeah. Okay, I'd love to hear it. Yeah, she went through her presentation with me as well, a child. So oh. it's worth hanging on for a second. She'll be back. <laughs> <laughs> hanging on. Uh, shall I answer one of the questions in the chat while we're waiting? That would be good. Okay. You so, time. Um, yep. Jerry asked a question about um, not teaching. She says you don't teach combination of vowels such as the EA combination. What stage do I instruct this uh, combination? So um, I would say that's level two. Level one is what I went through today. Level two, you start going into the diphthongs, the two, two letter combinations. So PH, um, I've got a whole a thing on that. I can put it up in the um, Google folder, a kind of outline of how to do that. And then, Tim, you said this is a dumb question. <laughs> if, if this is a dumb question, how could you access the Google folder? That was through the line chat. The I put the code up at the very beginning with a link to the Google folder. I can try and dig out um, a link to the Google folder so you can not have to use go through the line chat and put that in the Zoom chat while we're waiting. And I will put a copy of the slides without all the slides for the activities, activity slides up in there in just a moment once I've done that as well. So hopefully that answers um, those questions. Okay, let me get the um, Google folder link and put that in our meeting chat now while we're waiting. Technology can be so... Um, Frustrating. <laughs> Poor Alison. And then you can try and get into the folder. And if you have any problems, please let me know. So the link is going to come, just the link, oops, I've been in the wrong place. <laughs> okay, all right, and if you join the open chat, then you can also, if you've got follow-up questions, you try something in the classroom you want to ask, you can always, um, you know, put a question on the chat. And I hope that other people with their experience would, would join in on the chat too. Okay. Great. It was, an, it was another question. Uh, I have, In elementary, I don't teach combination vowels. Those hmm. would be uh, digraph, digraphs, yeah. E-A, T-E-A, cream or earth. How, right. what stage do I instruct this long? I would do that after you've done all the single combinations, get them blending, get them reading, get them confident, get them the feeling I can do this, you know, and then bring in the combinations. I'm going to. Here's see. Allison. Oh, yay. Okay. Oh, Hopefully, fingers crossed. Okay. Then I will step back out. <laughs> she steps in. Yeah, fantastic. Yay. Sorry about that. <laughs> it happens. <laughs> okay. Oh. Okay. 
How are we doing? Okay. okay, great. Sorry about that. My Wi-Fi just totally dropped out. Okay, good. So um, as I mentioned, I'm using picture books with uh, university students uh, at Ikyu University. And uh, one of the courses is just using them with university students at their own level. <clears throat> so we enjoy and analyze and uh, talk about the uh, topics presented at uh, their own level. And then another course I'm doing, which is in the fall semester, is uh, techniques for reading and enjoying a picture book. So in this course, we're more concerned with uh, mediating books uh, for children. And so um, we're learning how to use them in an interactive way. Okay, so thinking about what is a picture book, um, depending on your background, the image of what you think a picture book is, is going to be very different. For example, you might think it's a simple, predictable story, a bit like a Little Red Riding Hood, and we're just going to be reading it um, to children uh, for them to appreciate the narrative, the story itself. But let's have a look at this definition. Uh, this is a very long definition, so I've made it into uh, two slides actually here. And uh, let's just have a look at this and unpack the uh, different facets of the picture book. So <clears throat> it's definitely a text, there's written words, which if you're reading, then uh, they become uh, sounds for the students. Um, there's, there are illustrations. Total design is part of the picture book. We've got a cover, there are different elements in the picture book which all add up to our uh, experience. It is um, an item of manufacture, it's a commercial product. People, uh, the authors, the publishers want us to buy it, yeah. Um, but it's also um, uh, part of our social uh, uh, background, uh, also relates to cultural and historical aspects. And these become documents or insights into other worlds that we might not be familiar with or experiences that we know very well ourselves. And it's an experience for a child to sit and look through and uh, take, unpack a picture book. The second part of the uh, definition here uh, discusses how it's also an art form. Yeah? And there's an independence of what pictures and words. This is another reason why we need to use it interactively so that we know that the readers are picking up on all the nuances of not only the words, but the pictures as well and how they combine uh, in uh, com um, conveying the narrative to the learners. There's, there are two pages and there's a certain amount of drama as we turn the page and the uh, story, uh, you know, goes on and uh, we uh, uh, start thinking about what's going to happen. And the last part of this um, quotation, uh, the possibilities are limitless, is something that's really wonderful to think about because each teacher could use a picture book in a completely different way. So it really challenges us and our creativity in how we use them. So these are a couple of comments from students in uh, my classes who um, start looking at picture books, reading picture books, and understanding that the message is definitely not something just for children. Um, but as adults, we can uh, pick up a picture book, read it, enjoy it, and take away different messages. We can reflect on things in our lives. And uh, they're, they're important for people of all ages. Okay, so um, from the book, uh, How Picture Books Work, yeah, um, we can say that there's equal importance on the text and the illustrations. Um, and 
we often talk about this co-reliance of words and images that work together uh, to create um, the book's impact. If we look at an example here, um, this is from uh, the book uh, Fish is Fish by Leo Leone. And the two main characters are uh, a fish who's a minnow and a frog as well. Uh, the fish can only stay in the pond, but the frog can go off and enjoy the world. This is the scene where the frog comes back and says, I've seen extraordinary things. The frog explains to the fish, describes these extraordinary things, for example, birds. And the fish imagines in its own mind what a bird could look like. Um, it says here that um, the fish imagined large feathered fish. But until we see the illustration, we can't really understand that um, a fish can only imagine a bird as being a kind of like creature with wings. So here you can see how the meaning is carried very much uh, almost equally in the illustrations and the words on the page. This story goes on and the frog talks of cows. Without the illustration, we wouldn't imagine, we wouldn't be able to imagine how the fish sees a cow as a, a fish-like cow. And people, he imagines them as fish that are walking uh, and so on. So here we can really see how the words and the illustrations work together almost equally, uh, sometimes one more than the other, to understand uh, what's going on. So there are two different uh, sets of information, two different modes, and we have to integrate the information about the same events. And what better way to do this than to ask questions and confirm with each other what we're seeing. Um, a favorite uh, author of mine, Mac Barnett, um, put out this pro proclamation in uh, 2011, uh, hoping that people would show more interest in books, in picture books. And he wrote that we write for children, adults who, in, who read uh, with children, and adults who simply enjoy picture books in that order. So he's saying that, you know, just don't dismiss uh, picture books as something simple. He also says picture books are not a form of literature, not a genre, uh, not they're a, uh, an art form, sorry. Uh, not a genre of literature. I think this is because there's so much uh, emphasis on the illustrations. This is an example of a book by Mac Barnett uh, and uh, very deep. <laughs> what, what could be a deeper question than this one? What is love? So uh, looking at an example from Mac Barnett's book, again, uh, if you look at the text, there's uh, Sam and Dave and they're digging down and they're looking for something incredible. But uh, looking at the illustration, we can see something incredible. It's this huge gem that's right below where they are. But here they say, mm, I think we should dig in another direction. Good idea. There's no reference to the gem, the enormous diamond maybe that's there, apart from the dog that's noticed it. So in this situation, we've noticed the diamond, the dogs noticed the diamond, but uh, Dave and Sam haven't noticed it, not mentioned in the text at all. So uh, if we just read the text and moved on, we wouldn't have any chance to say, hey, what's there? They haven't noticed and uh, have that wonderful conversation and laugh about the fact that they're so near to something amazing, but they don't know it. Okay, so I begin to uh, sort of answer this question a little bit. Uh, so why use an interactive approach? Well, first of all, why use books in your classroom? Of course, this kind of uh, meaningful context is very motivating. And of course, we're focused on language learning. 
But for me, I think I've moved kind of a bit past that now. And I'm very much focused on uh, developing different thinking skills. And we're going to look into that in quite detail. And the fourth part here uh, relates to my uh, sweeping statement at the beginning, that they can be a change uh, agent and uh, contribute to the emotional development and also uh, attitudes of the uh, listeners, the children in our classroom. So um, Megan Dowd uh, Lambert famously uh, talks about the picture book being a playground for the mind. And I think it's a wonderful way to uh, look at it, um, not just for uh, children, but for children, adults to uh, come together, talk about the words, the illustrations. It's a great way to uh, bring us together, focus on something and uh, learn together and from each other. Um, in Jim Trelease's uh, Read Aloud Handbook, which I use as a textbook for some of my courses, he also notes that uh, students who um, have book discussions in classes uh, tend to score higher in tests and also become interested in reading for themselves later on. Mary Roche, who's done a lot of uh, uh, research in using picture books with children and uh, has a very interesting book, Developing Children's Critical Thinking Through Picture Books, wonderful book, um, talks about um, if we're using a book together critically, there'll be a lot of thinking going on. And she also uh, brings in this concept of what's called interthinking. So kind of uh, collaboration between the learners, uh, one person's ideas helping another person to connect and come to a conclusion. Uh, this concept of interthinking is something I'll refer to uh, a bit later. Um, Janice Bland uh, is a, a very well-known scholar, um, promotes picture books for language learning and many other uh, skills, uh, development of different skills. You know, teaching literature isn't transmission uh, purely these days. It's actually, again, she uses the word, it, it's a transaction, you know, of meaning different nuances people bring to the reading uh, it's a highly communicative event. And something I like to think of it is um, books, you know, um, reveal their meaning layer by layer. This is a lovely image to have. And as we're thinking of what questions we can ask, uh, we're diving down into those layers, a bit like um, an onion, I suppose. And uh, this is a comment from uh, a student who was getting ready for a read aloud, but she didn't really understand the book herself until she did the read aloud with different students and they uh, noticed things that she hadn't. And she really understood the book through this kind of um, uh, transaction, uh, this kind of collaborative reading and uh, uh, finding out the meaning, unearthing it together. Okay, so I think um, reading aloud with children really, uh, you know, lends itself to working collaboratively. We're reading the text and the pictures, noticing and understanding literal meanings, first of all. And then we're looking at the underlying figurative meanings. Okay, so sometimes we can notice uh, the literal meanings first. And then through a different kind of questioning, we can uh, even um, understand some of the figurative meanings, which could be very different for each reader as well. So it's nice, first of all, to ask closed questions for confirming and making sense of what's there in the pictures and in the uh, narrative. So we'd normally talk about it being a written nar narrative, but if we're doing a read aloud, that's a spoken uh, or verbal narrative. And then we can move on to asking more open questions, uh, trying to figure out what's implied by some of the images or some of the words. Let's look at a couple of examples of that. 
So uh, with the illustration at the top, yeah, first of all, I'd ask, uh, this is in Leo Leone's um, A Colour of His Own, about a chameleon who doesn't want to change colour. And the first question I'd probably ask is, what colour is the chameleon? So that's a closed question. There's only one answer. Uh, what colour is the chameleon? Is if anyone wants to unmute themselves. What colour is the chameleon? And purple. Yes, looks a bit purple, kind of a dark colour. Yes like very dark purple or maybe, uh, yeah, black. So you have to understand in the story that um, the chameleon doesn't want to change colour anymore. He tries sitting on a leaf to stay green, but autumn comes and the leaf falls down. And he look at his face here. Do you think he looks happy? What would you say is his mood right now? He looks contemplative, sad. He does, doesn't he? So perhaps the the dark color and his mood uh, are, are similar uh, in that respect. So maybe the the black represents his his mood, not only the fact that he's in. Uh, it's it's a uh, uh, winter and he's uh, alone in the long winter night. Okay, looking at the uh, two pictures below, uh, these are from um, a book called uh, While We Can't Hug, and it's about a, a hedgehog and a, a tortoise. Um, it was created during COVID, so it was a time when we couldn't meet people we love. And towards the end of the book, there are these two pages, and it's talking about friendship. And it says, through rain and shine. Okay. But uh, so we could ask the closed question looking at the first uh, illustration, saying, What kind of weather is this? The children probably aren't reading the words, so we'd look at the picture and say, what kind of weather is this? And it's rainy. Mm. How do they look in the rain? Do they look happy or sad? They look a bit sad. Mm, they do. So those are closed questions, but then we can move to open, more open questions. So through rain, um, could this... Um, be uh, representing a certain time in our lives, uh, for example, maybe a difficult time. So in difficult times, and then we turn the page and uh, now look at the weather. How's the weather here? On the right hand side. Sunny. Yes, it's sunny. And how do they look? Happier. They do. So uh, when it's sunny and we feel really great, um, uh, we smile and there's the phrase through rain and shine. This means in our relationships, it's not always uh, easy, even through difficult times or happy times, it's important to have a friend. So we're not just looking at the um, literal meaning here, we're trying to show that this is a phrase in English, through rain and shine, meaning through good times uh, and bad times, but opposite way around, through bad times and good times. Okay. So in this way, we can look at first one layer, and then depending on the age of the children, the context, we and the me overall message um, of the picture book, we can start to look at that uh, lower level, underlying level, um, through... Uh, uh, open questions, for example. Okay. <clears throat> um, I haven't really been looking in the chat. Oh, okay. Thank you for those uh, comments there. 
Um, great. Okay, so you've been joining in a little bit and uh, let's have a read aloud session. Okay, so now I'd like you to join in and uh, imagine you're a, a young child in the classroom and I've brought this book today. Uh, and this is the cover. So uh, first of all, I'd say, uh, what do you see? What do you see on the cover? <clears throat> Some animals. Yes. Can you count how many animals? Oh. Yes. And what colors are they? And of green and gold and reddish orange. Thank you. Wonderful descriptive words there. And is the green animal holding anything? Suitcase. Yeah. When do we use suitcases? When we want to go somewhere. Yeah. Would we use them like every day? No. Mm. Only far away places. I see, like going to Japan or somewhere. Yes. <laughs> we pack so, many suitcases. <laughs> yeah. So what does the suitcase tell us about the green animal? It's going somewhere. Mm, yes. And the others, do they have suitcases? No. No. So what do you think the difference is between the green animal and the yellow or uh, uh, orange or red animal? He's going somewhere they're not. Yes, absolutely. Okay. So often inside the cover of um, books, we can find a different design. Um, so if we take off the dust cover for this book, this is what you find inside. So in fact, what the cover we've just looked at, I wouldn't actually use with young learners because I want to reveal the uh, characters one by one. And I would start off with the very simple cover, uh, which is here. And we could talk about, like we just did, where, when do we use suitcases? Uh, yeah, uh, when we travel somewhere. And we're going to be looking at this book about uh, the suitcase today. Um, depending on the situation, we can look at the blurb on the book. Yeah. Um, with native speakers, we'd probably read the blurb before we begin. But if we want the, the students, the learners to come to their own conclusions, maybe we can look at these afterwards as well, not reveal too much. Here we have some more blurb uh, on the uh, front and the back of uh, the inside. Uh, covers of the book telling us a little bit about the author as well and these are the end papers end papers uh, are the first pages we see in picture books and looking at this if we've just dis decided that this is the inside of the suitcase would you say this is a new suitcase no no it looks a bit damaged and old right so that's important information Often to get the correct answer, it's very easy just to say the opposite, like I just did, yeah? So rather than saying, uh, how does the suitcase look, which is a difficult question, we can just say, is it new? Which obviously it's not. So moving on to uh, the first page here, we see again, the story is going to be called The Suitcase. This is uh, the title page here and we see the animal climbing up so he's uh he's green colored so can we call him green today is that okay so green's climbing up let's look at the dedication here it says for Maylene, Raphael and Lucille and for everyone who started a new life far away so that could cover uh, some of us as well how does the how does green look as he's climbing up a mountain? Does he look happy? 
fire. Sad. Mm. And how's the weather here? Is it a hot sunny day? It looks like it could be storming. There's a dark cloud, it looks like, above him. Yeah. Maybe this also uh, is mirroring his mood. Okay. And as we move on, just focusing there on him. Now we can see he's come down from the mountain. And can we see another creature here? Red bird. Yes, there's a red bird. And uh, he's looking at green and he's probably a bit surprised this person's just arrived, okay? Let's look at the text. A strange animal arrived one day looking dusty, tired, sad, and frightened. He was pulling a big suitcase. And the red bird says, hey, hi there. What's in your suitcase? So what doesn't the red bird say? What do we say when we usually meet someone for the first time? Hi back. Yes, when we meet someone for the first time, often we'd say, hello. You know, nice to meet you. What's your My name? name is, yeah. yeah, that's what we usually do in class, isn't it? But here the red bird says, hey, hi there. What's in your suitcase? So it seems a bit abrupt, right? But Green says, hmm, my suitcase. What do you think could be in his suitcase in the chat? Why don't you make some predictions? What kinds of things do you put in your suitcase? What things could Green have in his suitcase? Of course, we don't know. So there are no wrong answers. Any ideas? Mm. We often carry clothes, don't we? Yes, things he needs. Yeah. Okay. Hmm. Okay. Well, let's have a look. What Green says. What does he say? He says, well, there's a teacup. He says there's a teacup in his suitcase. Do you believe him? Everybody, do you believe him? Yes or no? Oh, everybody believes him, I see. Okay. Now, a new creature's appeared. Uh, green is green, the red bird's called red. So what's the new animal's name? Orange. Yes, okay. A teacup? Should we call him yellow? A teacup. Red says, that's a big suitcase for a little teacup. And green says, yes, I suppose it is. So um, they're kind of questioning Green, really. Do you have a teacup in your suitcase? But Green goes on. But there's a table for my teacup and a wooden chair for me to sit on too. So he says, I haven't just got a teacup in my suitcase. I've got a table and chair as well. Do you believe him? Now we've got some quite big items. It's not just a teacup now. He says in his suitcase, there's a table and a wooden chair. 
Oh, thank you, Rob. You're using lots of critical thinking. If it was a folding, yes, a folding table and a folding chair, maybe they could fit in. And your students will do the same thing. They'll be using their critical thinking. Yes, to think how that uh, he could fit those into his suitcase. Okay. Someone else has appeared. So now we've got red bird, we've got a yellow rabbit, and we've got an orange, an orange fox. Yes. And the orange fox says, there's a table and chair in your suitcase. Impossible. Yellow, the yellow rabbit says, well, it is, it's his suitcase. Red says, but a table and a chair, really? Green says, yes. So we can see the difference in opinion between the three characters here, yes? There's a range of different uh, opinions, yeah, and ideas. This is a great part of this book, showing that we don't all have the same idea or opinion. Green goes on. Green, green says, and there's a little kitchen in my wooden cabin where I make my tea. That's my home. It's on a hillside, surrounded by trees, and on a clear day you can see the sea. It's all there in my suitcase. Do you notice anything about the colours in this kind of picture compared to the colours of the animals? Are there any green on the trees or blue in the sea? It's all sepia, thank you. When do we use sepia? Is it in things in the present? Yes, so maybe this is something in his mind. Let's see. Green has come a long way, so he's very tired. I must have a little rest. You can understand how he feels. The other animals are left alone. Red says, what a strange animal. I've never seen anything like him before. Yellow says, neither have I, but we really should let him sleep for a while. The fox says, orange the fox says, well, I don't trust him. How do we know he's telling the truth? There's only one way to find out. What's the only one way? What's the only one way? He thinks there's only one way to find out. Thank you, Ruthie. Thank you. But do you think it's right to do this? We have a bit of a moral, moral dilemma here. Let's see. Should we do the thing, the only one way to find out? Sorry, my screen's frozen a little bit. <laughs> Here we go. Someone pass me a big rock. We're going to break open the suitcase and see what's inside. 
That's what Fox wants to do. Maybe we should, says Red. We need to know the truth. Yellow says, you can't do that. It's not ours. It's not our suitcase. What would you do in this situation? Which animal has the same opinion as yourself? Are you a kind of fox-like person? Yeah. Or do you think, no, Green's come a long way. We, sh we shouldn't break open his suitcase. See, <gasps> in no time at all, the suitcase was open. And what do we see in the illustration? There was a teacup. There was a little house and a table and a chair in a photograph. So, was Green lying? No, he had these things in his suitcase. C, a broken teacup and an old photograph. He lied to us, says Orange. Well, no, he, he did say there was a teacup, says Red. Yes, and now his suitcase is broken too. What will he think of us, says Yellow. Meanwhile, the sleeping stranger dreamed about running away and hiding about climbing over mountains and swimming across deep waters. Green had had a difficult journey coming here and he dreamed about his suitcase and all that he had inside. When he finally woke up, he couldn't believe what the other animals had done. He couldn't believe what the other animals had done. What do you think they had done? Something bad again? Or do you think they've done something positive, something kind? There are no words on this page. So it means that as the readers, we need to verbalize what's happened. So the narrative is completely uh, on the illustrations here. So we need to notice there's a cup, that it's been mended, been fixed, and it's on a table. Okay. Orange says, I'm sorry I broke your suitcase. We fixed it as best we could. Yellow says, and we've been busy while you were sleeping. Red says, I hope you like it. Green says, thank you. It's, it's perfect. Have a look at the house. Does it look like the house in the photo? What colors have they used in the house? Yes. What does it mean having all their colors together? So this is showing going from a closed question to an open question. It has all their colors. That's true, that's right. But what does that mean? 
when we have all our colors together. Thank you, Kate. But Green talks about another problem. There's just one tiny problem. You'd think that there are no more problems now. Green says, there's another problem. What could that be? We could ask our learners to think, what could be another problem? It's wonderful that they've built a little house, they've fixed his suitcase. <clears throat> Green says, we're going to need more teacups. And in his little house, you can see the photos of before and now having tea with his friends. And that's the end of the story. He goes from being an outsider to being accepted by the other animals, despite some questions and some mistakes as well. So um, moving on to the next section, thinking about what skills can we develop through read aloud activities. Through the demonstration we've just had, I think you can clearly see how we can develop students' critical thinking. There's a problem, what are the possible solutions? Part of this thinking process also involves creative thinking. We think creatively to think of lots of different options first, then we choose one answer at the end to solve the problem. So creative thinking and critical thinking really work together. Collaboration, you can see how your uh, ideas uh, came together one person's idea leads on to somebody else's idea and obviously communication. So 21st century skills can be touched upon and uh, developed through this kind of interactive uh, read aloud. Uh, another uh, framework that I often like to use is uh, Bloom's taxonomy. And I'm just having a problem with some slides. Not moving as fast as I want. Okay. Might move into this way of uh, showing you what um, I'm going to talk about next. So if we look at Bloom's taxonomy, this is the revised um, taxonomy, and I'm sure you're all very familiar with this. Um, we can start by um, looking at lower order thinking skills with uh, closed questions, but then as we move up the pyramid to higher order thinking skills, we can start looking at uh, developing these other skills, applying knowledge, analyzing, information, evaluating things and creating new things. How do we do this when we're planning a read aloud? Well, it's useful to look at these sets of verbs connected to Bloom's taxonomy. So um, I've picked up some words here. So in the lower level, uh, thinking skills, just describing what's happening yeah, is something we can do. Predicting what's going to happen is part of understanding. But as we move up the, to higher order thinking skills, for example, using knowledge, yeah, solving a problem, comparing and contrasting, yeah, rating something or designing something new or imagining things, these are all using higher order thinking skills. And these are tasks that we can prepare for students and uh, ways of questioning that we can use during a read aloud. 
So the book I already introduced, uh, While We Can't Hug, as I mentioned, it was produced in uh, COVID, while COVID was um, uh, quite prolific. And uh, it was uh, introducing ways that we can uh, show we love someone, even if we can't meet them. Okay. So I asked young learners before we read the book, how can we communicate with people who live far away without meeting them? Yeah. And you can see uh, in this simple grid of nine squares, uh, students, depending on their uh, level and the way they thought, came up with lots of ideas how we can uh, communicate with people who live far away. For example, sending a present. For example, making a phone with string. For example, using social media. For example, singing someone a song down the phone, perhaps. Or using sign language. So you can see how they've come up with multiple uh, solutions to a problem. And in the book, it goes through many uh, solutions as well and they can see which ones were the same as the ones that they thought of and which ones were different. So we can do this kind of simple problem solving uh, during the read aloud process. Um, we can ask students to design uh, posters. This is after reading uh, All Are Welcome Here and the students collaborated on producing this poster a beautiful poster showing uh, lots of different people. They had animals, robots, and even aliens who were all welcome to their classroom. We can ask students to design uh, clothes, to design shoes. These are after reading Pete the Cat. We can ask students to imagine different kinds of sheep. This is after reading where is the green sheep in which lots of sheep uh, appear. Uh, it's a great way to learn adjectives. There were all sorts of sheep, not just green sheep, but there are jumping sheep, there are circus sheep, there are all sorts of different sheep. And we can ask learners to continue and create their own sheep in a post-reading activity. Again, after reading A Colour of His Own, we could ask students to take the chameleon on a new journey and sh show through illustrations uh, where the chameleons could go. Uh, we can use and apply different art uh, creating techniques. This is a class using Eric Carle's way of using uh, paper and collage and the students created their own items, food items, which we uh, collaboratively uh, added to um, here and created our own Saturday page. So this is a collaborative project between all the members of the class to create our own uh, Saturday page for the Very Hungry Caterpillar. Here, the caterpillar was in Japan, uh, so he was eating through Japanese things as opposed to the Western style things that are in the original book. After reading Brown Bear, Brown Bear, What Do You See? The children created their own combination of colours and animals. And these are drew, drawn on fans, which make them very malleable and great for using to create <clears throat> original stories and chants within small groups or large groups. Um, you can get these kind of fans from Daiso, um, plain fans. What about compare and contrast? Seems a very difficult concept, but even with an easy book, for example, Yo Yes, um, we could compare the two characters, Bob and uh, William. These are the names the children gave the characters. We can find differences and similarities between the characters. So these are all higher order thinking skills that can be done with the young learners and using picture books. There's a difficult word rating something or evaluating something. You know, how can we get young learners to evaluate something? Well, after a read aloud, if we just ask, what was your favorite page? 
that's a really easy way of getting learners just to go through the story in their mind and pick out their favorite page and say why they like it. And this is higher order thinking, but very simple way of, of doing it in the classroom. There'll be lots of different answers, lots of different reasons as well. Okay. So um, I'd like to talk you through uh, using uh, the picture book we just read, The Suitcase, with uh, a class of learners. And looking at the background to the lesson and the stages I went through, um, just to explain, this is not in uh, one uh, school, it's at a community centre. Um, the students joined a class which was going to go on for the whole year. So they join in April and we meet every month, share different picture books. Um, they're actually from three different primary schools. So they're not an established group of learners uh, from age six to 11. So kind of a random group of children, but um, they took part in these sessions every month. And they really got used to my technique of just not really saying a lot and, and expecting them to shout out, um, think in a very collaborative way, bounce off each other's ideas and do lots of interesting uh, post reading activities, <clears throat> artwork uh, and such. <clears throat> So <clears throat> these are uh, some of the books that we covered in a year. Uh, often I pair books together. So for example, you can see I've got in the same session, we've got Bark George and Oh No George. So that was like a, uh, a, a session that was based around uh, the theme of, of dogs. Um, and there's two books about dogs called George. And we can read two books in a 90 minute session and they can compare uh, the messages in one and, and, and the other. So um, it's just a really nice way of introducing a couple of books that are, are similar but different. So we've got Wolf in the Snow and Wolves as well in the same session. Um, uh, these are just some examples of uh, book pairings. Okay, so we just read the book together, The Suitcase by Chris Naylor Ballesteros. And uh, Chris says himself, uh, I wanted to show that it might not always be easy to allow ourselves to accept someone or something unexpected. Um, that's his own message there. And uh, as some of you I noticed in the chat with saying that we could um, uh, think of it as a way of uh, developing empathy. Yeah, uh, it's also um, um, there's a message of accepting others, um, others that are different. So every time we mention the word different, we're thinking about diversity and inclusion. So we have the earth colored animals and then we have the green, yeah, strange animal. So Chris Ballesteros um, drew the character in a way that children wouldn't know what kind of animal it is so that it would be unrecognizable uh, and therefore an outsider, not easily classified uh, like the other animals. And um, why is this theme so important? Well, uh, as you know, in Europe, um, there are many, many uh, migrants coming into uh, European countries. Uh, if we compare the situation with migration in uh, Japan and the UK, uh, we can see that uh, UK is accepting almost seven times as many migrants as Japan. So you can see how this can be a really relevant theme for children in the UK. Um, Rudine Sims Bishop always talks about uh, mirrors and windows and uh, we need to be conscious when we're selecting books and creating a library for children that we're not just showing um, reflections of the children we have in the class, but we show mirrors into all sorts of different situations, social, uh, 
different relationships, different family backgrounds, economic situations, um, to show variety in our classrooms. It's also important to remember that when children cannot find themselves reflected, yes, uh, they feel devalued in society. Uh, think of yourself as well. You know, have you, do you have clear role models in society, in literature? Um, do you feel seen in the society that you're part of? And um, we have to remember that uh, in diversity, there's beauty, yes, and in diversity, it's also a, a strength of ours, yeah? We come together as a team. So as I was looking into different aspects of diversity, um, you come across um, primary and secondary diversity or different dimensions of diversity. Uh, these are all interesting things to think about. And as we bring in these kind of books uh, to work with children, what kind of diversity do we want to focus on? Yeah. Um, even something like bullying, yes, uh, mental abilities, uh, family status. We can find books that depict all these realities and we can bring them into the classroom and uh, work with them, work with children. So before I read the suitcase, we'd already looked at physical abilities um, with the two books, Amazing and Susan Laughs. I had students try different tasks, sitting down and standing up to notice if you were a wheelchair user, uh, how would that feel? Could you do the same things that you do regularly? In the book, Susan Laughs, uh, the very last page depicts her in a wheelchair. Yeah, but the wheelchair was black and quite um, uh, boring. So we designed her a new wheelchair. Some of these had um, propellers and umbrellas and there were beautiful colors. So in this way, we can combine uh, creative activities with critical thinking. Um, after reading It's Okay to Be Different, um, we did a, a, a project um, creating faces in the style of Todd Parr, the artist and author of It's Okay to Be Different. Each student just created one picture. The next week, uh, the next month, I brought back all their pictures together, collaborated into one big picture. Uh, again here, uh, that was a creative activity and a collaborative activity. But by asking each student, what was your favorite page? They had to look through the whole book, think of what was their favorite page and why. So that's using critical thinking right there. This was a lovely activity. I already introduced this a little bit. Uh, making posters after reading all a welcome. Um, and you can see how this concept of interthinking is really coming uh, uh, into uh, play here. Uh, how they're collaborating on the artwork, bouncing off each other's ideas. And in this project, we use the colors of the world's crayons uh, to get plenty of diversity in there. Another thing I'm always thinking about is how we can bring in social emotional learning into uh, read aloud activities. Uh, the first stage, I think, is to um, develop self-awareness so that we can at least identify and recognize our emotions. And the next stage out of the five areas would be to move on to social awareness. So uh, in the read aloud using the suitcase, I'm concentrating on social awareness uh, from a cell point of view. I'm thinking about uh, the themes of diversity and inclusion and thinking about migration and welping, welcoming strangers. So these are three different th themes behind uh, choosing the book uh, to use in the classroom. Again, to focus on critical thinking and creative thinking. Critical thinking is convergent 
and creative thinking is divergent. Usually we think um, in a divergent way, creating many uh, options, first of all, and then we choose one of those, which is critical thinking. So they often go hand in hand, um, but sometimes in lesson planning, I like to uh, separate them like this. So um, before the read aloud, we could use critical thinking um, skills and afterwards, uh, during the read aloud, we're generating ideas. And I asked this, the learners to create a new dialogue. Yeah. Um, so if green was to appear again, what would be a better way to welcome green? Remember um, red at the very beginning, he didn't say, or she didn't say, oh, hello, nice to meet you. What's your name? <clears throat> he just said, <clears throat> what's in your suitcase yeah so I asked learners to imagine what would be a better way to welcome green into that little community there so a nice uh, way of using books in a read aloud is in these four stages so um, today I didn't use an introduction uh, stage with you. We looked at the, um, the cover of the book to begin with. But when I do read alouds with children, um, it's nice to have that introduction stage even before you show the cover of the book. Okay? There's all sorts of things we can talk about and go from a very wide perspective into a, a narrow narrower perspective before even showing the cover of the book because once we show the cover of the book we um we reduce the or um reduce the scale of the topic we can talk about because we're going to be focusing on uh the illustrations on the cover or the topic so i like to work with these four stages introduction which is free talking then pre-reading, looking at the cover of the book. During reading, of course, yes, pretty obvious. And post-reading, things we can do afterwards. So this is a, a very useful um, kind of concept or step-by-step -step approach uh, for planning for a read aloud. So um, when I did the book, The Suitcase with Learners, um, in the introduction or the pre-reading stage, uh, I had uh, a graduate student of mine come on that day with a suitcase. And before we even looked at the book, before they knew what we were doing, I said, you know, oh, this is a, a stranger in our classroom and he's got a suitcase. And I asked my graduate student, what's in your suitcase? He's, he told us there was a Santa, there were some Christmas trees, and there was a dog in his suitcase. And I already asked students to set, uh, make choices, like, do you think he's telling the truth? Um, this kind of thing. So we did a role play as an introduction to the book, which you just read together. During the read aloud, um, in the, you know, through Zoom and in the chat, I did ask you to kind of make decisions. Do you think he really had a teacup in his suitcase? Yes or no? With children, I made these papers which had just yes and no. So they had to make concrete decisions throughout the read aloud. Um, after the read aloud, um, my graduate student uh, from the Philippines opened his suitcase, revealed what was inside. Of course, there were little Santas, a little Christmas tree and a photo of his dog. So he wasn't lying and uh, we had a look at that. We learned some phrases to welcome him because we hadn't done that when he appeared. So I was trying to relate the book to actual situations in the students' lives. Another way of doing this was we watched um, a video about a student, a little girl who'd come from the Ukraine to live in Japan. And this was a short documentary, a clip from the news about um, her going to Japanese school for the very first time. So I wanted the learners to be aware that it wasn't today's read aloud just wasn't about animals. Um, it was something that could actually 
um, happen to them. You know, they could go to school on Monday and a student from the Ukraine or another country could be there coming to learn with them in their classroom. Um, so post reading, uh, I mentioned that I asked them to um, make uh, a new conversation. And this was uh, the first meeting of the animals. Uh, what should they have said to Green on uh, that first meeting rather than just asking what's in your suitcase? So looking at responses from learners, um, I got a huge amount of uh, materials to look at. One of those was the transcript, uh, which I uh, typed out and uh, could start looking at, um, for example, how the students were co-constructing meaning together. So um, I asked them, uh, what kind of animal is this? And they said, it looks like a lizard. Really a lizard? No, I think it's a dragon. Yeah, it's a dragon or a lizard, um, but we're not quite sure, are we? Uh, what color is it? And they can say it's green. Okay, so let's call him green. So you can see how this concept of interthinking is really uh, effective here. The students are kind of bouncing ideas off each other and co-constructing meaning. Um, you mentioned about folding chairs, and this is exactly what the children do. What's in his suitcase? Um, a cup's inside, but it has to have bubble wrap, yeah? Otherwise, it will break. Maybe there's money. Maybe there's food in his suitcase, yeah? Um, they were surprised to see a table and a chair. Will it fit? Oh, if it's a folding chair and a table, yeah? So... Comments very similar to those you gave in the chat. Um, during this page where uh, Green is swimming, swimming along and using his suitcase as a kind of a, a buoyancy aid here, one of the students said the suitcase is like a boat. Yeah. Um, and that's a wonderful uh you know, um, idea that's just come from uh, the student themselves. It shows creative thinking. They're looking at the suitcase and thinking, actually, it's, it's just like a little boat for Green here. And maybe that's why this suitcase is so important to Green, because it's helped him, it's assisted him uh, it, on this terrible journey. Again, looking at the transcript, uh, as you uh, mentioned in the chat as well, what does uh, what colors are the little house? They said it's like a rainbow. Oh, uh, but what does it mean, all those colors? And it, they said, it means let's be friends. So you can see how we can go from closed questions to open questions. What does it mean? And these are some of the um, conversations that they um, created, a bit like a kind of manga yeah, afterwards. And looking at the illustration on the right, you can see how uh, they're adding uh, speech bubbles, but also uh, thinking bubbles. So maybe um, the animals are thinking one thing and saying something different. Very interesting. And things that I noticed that the dialogues were very open, sensitive, friendly. Um, they used set phrases. Yoroshiko onegaishimasu. Most of the students put those in. These students are just regular primary school, uh, Japanese primary school students. Um, we used a lot of Japanese in the uh, classroom. Um, Let's uh, have a look at their questionnaire. So we did a bit of a detailed questionnaire and they said they wanted to be friendly to people they didn't know. If they went to a different school, they would like someone to say, let's be friends. And if a child 
came to your school from the Ukraine. They said at that time, after reading the book, they'd like to become friends. So uh, some of the older, elder children could read a book together. And if I asked them, what's the message? They could come up with a reply. This is because we've worked together for three years, almost every month looking at different books. So I'm not saying any child could do this. Um, there's a lot of training involved, but um, a sixth grader's answer was that they accept and cheerfully welcome even those we don't know is the message. And what did you learn about it? Uh, through the reading today, I learned greetings are important. Um, if we go back to the author, what did the author want to actually um, convey through the story? He focused more on mistakes, yeah? Sometimes we make mistakes, but it's important to say uh, you're sorry. So uh, I tried to uh, present uh, this different uh, reality where uh, migration uh, is something that happens uh, to students in Europe, but actually I thought um, it was a mirror of uh, uh, Japanese society and also something, a reality that they could experience. These days there are so many different books out there, it's really easy to touch on all sorts of different social problems and um, my aim at the moment is to become a kind of a picture book sommelier. This means that rather than um, like a, a wine sommelier um, uh, who matches uh, food and wine, I would be able to match any kind of set of children uh, with different learning backgrounds and wanting to learn about a topic with a picture book. And my message at, uh, that I explained and introduced at the beginning, let's change the world one book at a time. Yeah, uh, we can find resources these days, uh, even on Instagram. So in, on Instagram, I follow a lot of people who recommend diverse books especially a uh, children's library lady is a wonderful person to follow. She introduces books. She introduces the topics that we can discuss. So obviously uh, advocating an interactive approach. She'll even introduce discussion questions that we can ask. Um, so these sorts of resources are out there. So as you're choosing books to use in the classroom, uh, obviously look at the themes, but also be aware of the different authors. If you can show that you have a very diverse range of, range of authors in the books that you're using, then that's going to, uh, their messages are going to flow through into your classroom. So um, I've got my references here. And sorry about switching to this format uh, for the uh, end of the talk, but for some reason my computer was not wanting to go on to the next slide. So um, <clears throat> when this kind of situation happens, you've just got to go with the flow and use the tools available. So I apologize for uh, the different format from halfway through, but uh, that's the end of my session. So if we'd like to go to any questions maybe for the last 10 minutes. How are we doing for time? We're getting close to one. So mm -hmm. anyone who needs to leave early, uh, don't hesitate. Uh, and anyone who has further questions should feel welcome to stay. Gabby and I are here and our speakers are here. So questions for Allison, um, questions for Kate that didn't get answered before. Anything goes. Okay.
Alison, could I just ask you one question about mm -hmm. what do you think about the use of L1 in the classroom? There was also a comment from Ruth about yeah. L1 use as well. Yeah. And I noticed in some of your pictures you had them, they were doing conversations in Japanese as well. So what is your take on using the L1 with the picture books in the way <laughs> you are using picture books? Thank you very much. Um Yes, yeah, so the group um, I was working with are regular um, Japanese public school students from grade one to grade six. They haven't had any specialized English training, only the classes they get at school. Um, none of them are going to any kind of English juku or conversation school. So um, very um, normal students with limited English. So um, for me, rather than in this situation, language acquisition per se, I was focused on trying to uh, introduce a range of different books to them, get them interested in literature was a, a goal. Um, also to open up their world to lots of different opinions and situations. And this was done through the tool of English. So rather than focusing on their output in English, um, very much input in English, but discussion as well in Japanese, often with closed questions, they would answer in English. So looking at the transcript, it was very interesting. At the beginning and at the end, when I'm asking like, what color? is the bird or how many animals, they'll obviously answer in English. Um, but later on, if I'm asking deeper questions, obviously that's going to be in Japanese. Um, if I was using this with students, for example, in different context, for example, in language school context, I would then go ahead and read the story again the next week, for example. We, we just had one session a month so, and, and every time I brought a different book. Um, but the way to bring in English later is to reread the book with the students again and again in English later on. So you deal with the same book, maybe four, five, six times as many as the students wanted to reread. So you can go from a mixture of English and Japanese in the first reading to all English later on but it doesn't have to be all English the first time, um, of course, depending on your learners. With my university students, it's all English all the time, uh, even for the deeper que deeper questions, yeah. Thank you. I have a question as well. Um, in the beginning of your talk, you said uh, picture books can be a, a form of art rather than a book. Um, and that refers to the pictures, but also to the text, I would argue. Do you read the text as it is? Do you simplify the text? Um, most of the text had pretty low frequency words. I would be worried I would lose my younger learners. How do you handle that? Mm -hmm. So again, I would um, re like scaffold in... Japanese as well as English, yeah. Um, but often what I do is like, we'll just look at the page and say, what do we notice, yeah? And so we've already kind of formed the narrative. And then I'll say, well, you know, I'll read what's on the page. So rather than reading first, I ask them to notice first. Notice first, say the words. Oh, there's an animal. Okay, there's a green animal. There's a red bird, okay. It's just arrived, okay, and we've established that. And then I'll read the text in, in a first reading, yeah? Um, so people think the English in picture books is simple, but actually vocabulary is quite high level and uh, low frequency words are used in picture books. Um, so we can modify language definitely, yeah? But for intermediate or even adults, higher uh, level learners, it's a nice way to uh, grasp vocabulary as well. Because often 
uh, a bit like Kate was saying with the, what was it, the gurgling water, yeah? Things like that are interesting for, for advanced learners, yeah? Because the picture books I use are focused at native speakers. They're not um, designed for uh, L2 learners. Uh, so there are some very difficult words in there as well. Does that answer your question, Ruthie? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Going back to uh, Kate had similar questions in the chat box about use of first language teaching mm -hmm. phonics. Uh, let me go back and see if I can find the question. Okay. Percentage of Japanese you use in the classroom? Well, I can't say. I've, I've yeah, that's hard to say your own percentage, but. Um, yeah, and I ha I certainly haven't measured, measured it. Um, I think one of the things we need to, to remember is who's teaching. Um, and for example, when I walk into the classroom, I have to be aware if I'm walking into a classroom where A, the students are not familiar with me on a regular basis, that initially they're going to, okay, it's a foreigner. There's an instant wall that exists and I have to acknowledge that. I think it's just sensible too. If you're in your own school and they're coming every week, they get familiar, they get used to you. And it, I think it, then the, the context is quite diff different um, because they're less, you know, they're less nervous, they're more willing to try, that they're, they're prepared to make mistakes. So I think, um, you know, the context is the first thing that you need to think about uh, is to the use of L1 in the classroom. I think um, naturally L1 is going to, the use of L1 can definitely help with the learning. Um, say for example, with phonics, someone was um, asking a question about um, the sounds and how to create the sounds. And I model the sounds using my mouth. Um, if a child is having difficulties, you can always use a mirror. But the point is, um, if I'm going to say, no, you need to open your mouth more, I'm gonna say that in Japanese. So that kind of instruction, I'll definitely say in Japanese because I want them to understand it. I don't want them to try and understand it because they're trying to learn the language. They're trying to learn the sounds rather than trying to learn to understand the instructions. So um, if I'm actually in a classroom and I'm wanting them to learn the language while I'm teaching the activity, I'll do the activity in English. You know, I'll do the instructions in English as part of the language learning. But um as I said, you keep keep focused on what you want the children to learn when you're doing whatever you're doing. So um, with a limited time and you want them to be able to, you know, produce the sounds um, as accurately as possible or as you know close to you know, how it's being modeled as possible. And they're having difficulty. And just to say a couple of words in Japanese is going to, you know, really um, release that frustration and that that sort of feeling they may have inside of I can't do this. You just give them a simple explanation in Japanese and it's all gone. I think that's obviously the better way to go. So, you know, what are you trying to achieve? How are you trying to achieve it? And what is the context? So all things we need to take into consideration when using or not using, you know, L1 in the classroom. I mm, hope that answers <laughs> the question. One thing that I thought listening to both um to both talks was uh, that what Kate's doing is much easier to quantify and to show results to parents that ask, what is my child actually learning? Than what uh, the picture book talk and what Allison's talking about, you know, the child can say, mom, I came home and thought critically. And the mother was, oh, that's nice, dear. But what did you learn? Um, that's where both are so important. That's uh, where a system, I think, you know, Ruth, I've, I've spent years developing this system so that it is quantifiable and is measurable and you can show the parents. So, you know, I'm sure there is a system that, you know, can be put in place with what Alison is doing. Like, a, you know, she's got evidence there written mm -hmm. evidence with with this with the um you know the fans and stuff and what they've done so if as long as that evidence is transferred into something that the parents can understand it's quantifiable mm -hmm. then you've got it yeah yeah so every week they're taking home what uh, you know artwork from class um which they've created through english i wouldn't say completely through only english 
but they're um you know the message has been uh, transferred to them through the medium of english and they're producing things in japanese but um you know there has been english involved <laughs> um but definitely they've built up a uh, love of books some of the parents have said suddenly mm -hmm. they want to go to the library and borrow books one of my students got an award for reading the most japanese books in her school yeah so this kind of love of literature and books is something that's very concrete so we've still got more questions here and alex has his hand up should we go to alex first Hello. Hi. Hi. I, uh, I have uh, one question for each speaker, for Dr. Hasegawa and Dr. Sato. Um, maybe for Dr. Hasegawa, uh, I, I found that when I repeat a book um, in my class, the atmosphere becomes less contemplative and students are like speaking out the answers that they remember from the first time we did the book. Um, and so, I just wanted to know, like, how do you change your approach or adapt to something like this happening uh, on repeat readings, if you do change at all? And then for Dr. Sato, um, when I get a new class, uh, they almost always know how to do the alphabet song, and the alphabet song is A, B, C, D, E. So they're learning by letter names. Um, so I just wanted to know uh, your opinion on uh, is there a place for letter names when teaching young learners? And then what time or place would you introduce this or use this? Uh, thank you. Allison, you go first. Okay. So um, thank you, Alex. Uh, lovely to see you. Um, <laughs> um, unfortunately, like I said, I haven't had the chance to really use books first time, second time, third time with the kids that I've been working with. We use a, different, a new book every time. So I'm very uh, envious of your situation where you can keep reusing books. Um, I think, like I said, I would focus on them almost like memorizing the story and focusing in on the language. Maybe you could break them into groups and parts and, you know, like you could have like um, character cards and they could take the part and almost use it like a script and, and enact the story. Uh, depending on the numbers of kids you have, that would be uh, something uh, that you could possibly do to uh, bring the picture, the the English and the story alive with the learners um, reading out the parts. Is that an idea that could work? Oh, definitely. I I, I have twenty five kids. There are three teachers in the class, so I I like breaking into small groups when I can. So that's great. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, I'll jump in. Um, so teaching the alphabet, they come in, they know the alphabet. And to know the alphabet is important. And of course, it has a place in the English language classroom. Um, if we think about why do we learn the alphabet? What function does it serve, uh, especially in the L2 classroom? Um, of course, then we can tell them, you know, how to spell something or some, how something is spelt. Um, Personally, what I did, um, and I, I, to be honest with you, it was a bit of a struggle to get the parents to understand this. Um, I would get phonics in first, one year of phonics in before teaching or reteaching, if you like, because a lot of them already knew it, the alphabet, because the use of the alphabet is more limited than knowing the sounds of the letters and how they combine together. So they both have a part. Um, but I think if you can get phonics in first, there's less confusion later on. Hmm. I hope that answers your question. Mm. There's yeah. also the option of doing it all in one whack. If you do uh, that. I wasn't asked the question, but if you have a chant, A, A, Apple, B, boy. Doing, it depends on what age group you're going to do that with. And it can be confusing to some of the, the, the learners that need more time. So. I, I recommend taking it in steps and making sure they've got each step very concretely in, internalized before doing that. Can I, can okay. I add something too? Yeah. I'm, I'm pretty passionate about phonics. Um, one way I use my Japanese to explain that to kids is very simple. A is the letter's name, onamai. Mm. And 
every letter has nakigo or makes a sound. Um, and they understand that from the first age four or five, mm -hmm. a letter has a name and a sound. Namae to nakigoe. Mm -hmm. And my, my young learners learn them both at once because I use a different phonic system that does teach it all at once. But as Kate said, doesn't focus on the capital letters. Mm -hmm. Capital letters are minor and small letters are really everything. But depending on the age and the child's uh, inclination or motivation, it, some kids, it takes two or three years before that kicks in. Other kids get it four years old. So, yeah. mm. Just with a, a different terminology, I, I used to teach the name of the sound, uh, uh, the name Namai and Oto, Oto, the sound oh. of the sound. Mm. Yeah, Oto, mm. yeah. Yeah. I like saying nakigoe because it makes them think of the alphabet as animals, birds or something. And it's super easy for them to understand. Mm, mm. It's harder for the parents to understand, I have yeah. to say. Yeah. Uh, like Kate, I have to do a lot of talking with parents. Mm. Uh, yeah, for one of the programs at our school, we, you guys mentioned David Paul. So mm -hmm. David Paul has the sound alphabet that we use like ah, uh, ah, uh, ah. Uh. And I can't, sorry, I haven't taught that course for a while, but it's a, it, it's a sound based uh, alphabet chant. So I, I, I think I can start uh, adding that one in as well. Thank you. I think Tim has a question as well. Yeah, just a quick question. Uh, Kate, sorry, could you repeat that, um, that code for the line chat? Uh. Oh, it's a QR code. Um, so no, I mean the uh, the number. There was a uh, oh, yeah, password. Sure. It's today's date. It's two three one two one zero. Okay, two three one two one zero. Okay. The link to the the link to no, the Google folder the is eleven no, minutes and thirty seven seconds into the chat. I do. Yeah. I made a memo. So if it's you want to directly the recording, to the Google so. folder. <laughs> uh, okay, the chat. The chat is 11 minutes, yeah. 34, 37 seconds in. Oh, hold on. Hard to find things in the chat. Yes. Okay. Got it. Thanks. On your end. Namiko had a question for Kate, um, and I think she's no longer here, but I'll relay the answer. She asked about teaching sight words that are essential for reading, which can't be addressed with phonics mm -hmm. and the quest what's the question sorry uh do you have any tips how do you teach sight words okay so once they're blending they realize that you know these are things that could put together to make a word once they've got that that concept then you can you, you can start introducing yeah i had them on cards um and like i had these you know the cvcs and i would have the, the sight words and tricky words and I would put them down and just teach them. Mm -hmm. You said you use blending to teach the sight words? No, I said once they're blending, then I would throw in sight ah, words. Once they're blending, then you throw in sight words. That makes sense. And that's, you see, that works on um, another skill, another cognitive skill in the brain that they're already using for katakana and kanji. So they can then pick that up and write on that one. Mm. But I get them blending first before we do that yeah are there any more questions or comments something else in which oh is there any research on how reading in l2 helps learners with the comprehension of stories in their own language ah mm -hmm. i re i don't understand the question <laughs> Because own language is uh, L2. L1. So. Own language would be L1. So if you're reading in your L second language, does that help you with comprehension in your own language? Own language. That's an interesting question. Mm -hmm. This is from Namiko. Is Namiko still here? Mm. She's still in the chat. I don't see her here. 
you'd have to do a a search for that but um i mean i i use uh the learners l1 so that they can instantly say something yeah that they're thinking and communicate then i can recast that into english yeah and we can confirm and move on so um i'm very much for use of l1 in my very narrow situation with these these kids just meeting them once a month yeah um i've stopped that program now but um yeah it depends on what your emphasis is you know uh so for me i was saying uh language acquisition was not the most important thing it was uh introducing uh different books and um uh, developing a love of of exploring books yeah there's been very interesting research on decision making in l1 and l2 um and how people make different decisions they're more pragmatic in l2 than l1 so that that would definitely influence um the comprehension i think i think there's another question for kate there from ames moving from elementary to junior high school do you think it's worth to link phonics to ipa because the textbooks have IPA for new words. Yeah, and I was just uh, answering. <laughs> <laughs> I think that that's a really complex uh, question. It's going to depend a lot on the context and the type of students and what kind of environment they're in. But personally, your average student of that age, like they're not going to Juku, they're not going to, a, you know, an Ego Gako or anything like that. They've got, you know, the limited exposure. They're trying to learn the alphabet and how that all comes together. And then to add on that IPA, I think, you know, you're, I, I can't be convinced that you would be setting your students up for success. Um, obviously, long term, there are benefits, but maybe junior high three or, you know, high school at that stage. But first of all, the teacher needs to be able to be confident with it, too. So I think, you know, that's where the teacher it starts there, doesn't it, with the teacher training? Yeah, they have iPhones. They're not going to take the time to learn IPA when they can get the pronunciation uh, instantly with an iPhone. And I urge my junior high students to save time and use their iPhones, actually. IPA is a different kettle of fish that was really useful in a different generation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That was a good question, though. It was. Mm -hmm. yeah. I think, I think Questions were excellent today. They were good. Yeah. yeah. Okay, I think there was one more question about whether the picture book presentation slides would be available to on. Um, I know the video will be available, so I hope that's enough. Okay. Thank you. Namiko, you're welcome. <laughs> It was wonderful to have such a good turnout and two such excellent speakers. I'm really happy. Um, maybe before we close the meeting, one more mm. round of applause for both of them. Thank you. Thanks. That was Sorry great. about technical glitches. Yeah. It was very smooth, Allison. Yeah, <laughs> you never panicked. <laughs> There's no point in panicking. <laughs> Wi-Fi will come back. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Like clapping hands. <laughs> well, thank you all for coming today. Thank you for inviting yeah. us. Thank you, thank you for fabulous. everybody's participation. It made it so much. Yeah. Yeah. So thank you both very, very much. I'm Joseph very asked when the video portion will be available. And these days, uh, the videos um, are edited and they come up pretty quickly on the Jout YouTube channel. So I can't say exactly, but the last few videos have come up pretty quickly within a week or two. <laughs> Thanks, Heather. Thank you. Pauline, I'm not quite sure I understand your question. How do we use the voiceless TH? Ooh, is there a question about TH? Yeah, the, the, the voiceless, like the think. Mm -hmm. I'm not mm -hmm. sure what she or what Paulina means by that. 
How do we use the voiceless? Is it the yeah, voiceless the, sounds? Like think. Three and there. Three is voiceless and there is voice. So how do we use? What do you mean by use? So TH and there or voiceless T. Oh, she said the voiceless TH. Yeah. I don't understand the question. <laughs> mm. I teach them as a pair, the voiced and unvoiced, you know, and I do that with them. Uh, F and V, that's how they get the V very easily as well. Pair them up. And when students, when students make mistakes uh, later on, they're, you, they're often related to the pairs. Hmm. I found the longer that I teach. B, pop, Just pop. a voiced and voiceless mistake. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah. Alina said she starts from age two teaching sound recognition. That's great. But I think you know any kind of uh, any kind of speech, if it's engaging, is sound recognition at age two. Mm -hmm. If it's engaging to a two-year-old, then. Mm -hmm. Hey, and thank you for coming. Oh, I could make one last comment to Allison. Mm -hmm. In the book about the journey with the suitcase, oh, I watched a really scary TV drama. This has nothing to do with language acquisition, but it was the same dilemma uh, to believe the person about what was in the suitcase. But all the office mates sub uh, uh, suspected something terrible. And he actually had a girlfriend in the office and she bowed to the pressure and she opened the suitcase and it was a severed head, mm. an actual severed head. This was the practice. This was decades ago, but that's all I could think about reading your book. I was really glad that there was nothing creepy <laughs> and it had a really happy ending. Thank you. I think it really shows forgiveness because Green is, he, although they've been oh. through this really difficult journey, they're so forgiving. You know, he never gets angry and says, why did you open my suitcase? Why did you break it? Yeah. So forgiving. Yeah. I wanted more focus on the conflicted character because one of them was like super positive and one was super negative, but then there was the conflicted color. Was one that in one? the middle. Yeah. Yeah. I wanted a little more focus on the conflicted it's one. Nice. That's like most of us. Yeah. Yeah. If I had more time, <clears throat> I would have done it a lot more slowly. Yeah. That's a great book. It's mm -hmm. wonderful, isn't it? The effort yeah. made also from the characters to, 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 how do you say, to, to repair the situation, mm -hmm. you know, to rectify that's it. Yeah. What they've done was yeah, tremendous. Mm. Everyone in the chat box was very engaged with that. It's great. Yeah. I was having technical problems trying to get it onto the next page. I was like hitting the key like oh. five times to get it. I was like, ah, oh, don't freeze on me. But you look so calm. <laughs> You're totally calm. When when you've been through a natural disaster, everything else just doesn't like make you freak out as much. Mm. So that's the secret of my calmness. <laughs> <laughs> if it's not life threatening, yeah. we'll deal with it. I wondered if Kate misses a Kaiwa, and if you do, what aspects? What aspects of it do you miss? Um, I really miss in being in the classroom with the kids mm -hmm. by myself, and you know the spark of teaching when um, I, I, you know. What I didn't talk about today was how to incorporate the phonics integrated readers. And I, I had this whole system set up mm -hmm. where this was, they were reading graded readers. And when they read their first book, it's just a very small, simple book though, but when they've read that and the joy, the spark that, the, you know, the realization of I've read a book in another language, you know, and they're like five or six or four or, you know, whatever age they are. And that is just so rewarding as a teacher that's just like, oh, 
are you? You know, it's just uh, to me that's just like golden nuggets, golden nuggets. Yeah. So um, yeah, that's uh, something that I really I do miss a lot. You know, I'm in the classroom now with at a local elementary school. There's a Japanese teacher with me. A lot of people come and watch the the cultural sensei is always in there taking photographs to put on the blog. Oh, you know, it's it's and then and you know then visiting professors come and watch and you know things like that and then trainee students come in and watch and it's, it's just not the same. It's you don't have that intimate environment with the kids and you see their progress over a long period of time. Yeah, that's what I miss. But I don't miss the parents at all. <laughs> <laughs> well, I was the the photos that both of you showed, especially Allison's photos. The environment looks so well organized and orderly. Did you teach any classes that really were chaotic when you were trying to read a book, Allison? Mm, not really. I mean, the chaos is later when we're doing finger painting. Yeah. Um. <laughs> So you didn't show those ones. <laughs> <laughs> I was sort of waiting for the chaos photo, but your photos all looked, even the chairs were arranged so neatly. Well, at the community center, I had an assistant and she uh -huh. always like did all of that part and always took loads of photos of every session. So uh -huh. sort of 25 session, I have a file of photos for every session that oh, she my. took because it's a, a public um you know um place of learning and they need to keep a record that I was actually there because uh, they paid me some uh, small amount of money every time I did it yeah so uh yeah it was all recorded for prosperity wow. <laughs> which was really useful for me well thank you again I could have listened to both speakers for a longer time that was that was really really good thank you uh, so much yeah, thank you all so much. December is such a busy month. We're really, really happy we got two such good speakers and such a great audience. I think it was a nice contrast as well, the topics. Mm, I do too. I do too. Gabby, yeah. you snagged two good ones. Yay. <laughs> I agree. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'm going to bow out a little bit early. Thank you again. I'm going to pop off. Thank okay. you so much. Bye bye. Mm. Yeah. Bye, -bye. bye bye. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Heather. Is recording. Okay. And thank you, Heather. Bye. You, Heather. Thank, thank you. you so much. It was nice. I enjoyed it. Okay. Well, bye bye. Thank you. Bye bye. Oh, you answered. Okay. Okay. I did, yeah. I've I've gone onto the uh, onto a website, so I, I just wanted to, yeah. I mean, you know, phonics is a step towards reading in L one, but in L two, it has so much, so much. It's got a, such a broader function because it's mm -hmm. teaching the sounds of the language. It's, you know, connecting so many. It's you know the listening skills. It's honing because we can all, you know, as long as we don't have hearing impairment, we can all hear. But phonics requires listening skills, so they actually have to listen and then try and reproduce the sound and that's um you know that itself is another skill a listening skill rather than just hearing you know so that that phonics helps train that if, of course if a child is having music lessons you you can tell the kids that have music lessons generally because they're quicker they, they're already listening mm -hmm. so, then, so you've got you know the, then they're then they're speaking as well they're trying to make the sound too it's not just learning the print and learning how to read there's just a whole lot more to it in the l2 classroom that uh, you know supports teaching phonics so it's a little yes. bit mm. topic, you know, the science of reading Re reading is one one benefit of phonics but it's not the only benefit I think that it's has to be a holistic you know, process, isn't it? Really, it is. It's very holistic. It's very um, multi-sensory um, as well. It can be as well in the small, you know, kids' classroom, multimodal. So it's you know you can encompass all things with with phonics if you want to. Yeah. Anyway, we I... to try to make room in the elementary classroom. <laughs> Oh, that's you know, I do. I do at university. I like, um, I was at Sapogakin last month. I'll be at Bunkyoda next month in January, and I do a 90 minute session. I do what I did today in 90 minutes, and they go through the activities. And we just so it is possible to do, yeah. Mm. I've, 
I've had my research. Um, I've got my research cameraman who always comes with me. So I'll try and pop that up online um, so that you can watch it just for you, Gabby. So you could yeah, <laughs> watch how I do that when I'm doing the teacher training. Do you know, though, Kate, how many teachers would actually use phonics in the classroom these days? Do you have any? I don't actually, because well, I think it, it's going to depend on pre prefecture and prefecture. And you've got some teachers who are using it in the junior high, like if you when you see what the research papers that are going out. But when right. you look at the junior, the elementary school textbooks, it's literally saying this is a letter and this is how it's sounded. There's there's mm -hmm. no output, there's no processing, there's no blending. Right. And so somehow miraculously, the child by themselves is supposed to put it all together. It's not going to happen. I mean, it's baby steps in the textbook. And of course, the elementary school teachers are not English teachers. So without the training, uh, it's challenging. So that's why I wanted to create a system where they felt like mm -hmm. they could teach it. You know, it's mm -hmm. doable, uh, even if they, um, even if it's to a limited extent. But they can, they can do more than that's being done now. So yeah, I think it's very limited. I do do my bit, <laughs> but again, it's one part in a sort of. Yeah, but I think if every teacher, you know, if every uh, university like yours, like, you know, the Kyoikudai and if, if the teachers um, just did one session on phonics, just to say this exists and yeah. you can do it. Um, yeah, I would, you know, that would be a start. Yeah, mm. that would be a start. But yeah. They, they actually put it in like, again, if they just do 10 minutes a lesson, like if they're a third year teacher. Yeah. Perfect timing, isn't it, to put it in there? In Absolutely. Those 35 lessons a year. Next year, I've got a junior high school teacher who I I did a teacher I did a training course with him last year, and he's willing to put it into his school as long as the principal is willing. So I will mm. be yeah, good. Yeah, so I hope that'll be a sort of pilot session. But mm. it's junior high; it's not elementary, <laughs> but it's a start. <laughs> we want it in elementary school, really, don't we? We really do. We do. But uh, anyway. Better late than never, I suppose. Yeah. Well, I better let you go. So I'm well over time. So thank you very much. And thank you to my and Melanie and Paulina who stayed right till the end. Yeah, thank so you. Thank you, you very much. Yeah. Thank so you. thank you very much and enjoy the rest of your day. <laughs> thank, you. thank you very much. Thank you, everybody. Yeah. Bye. Okay, I'm going to close soon now. So thank you for joining us today. See you later.